We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. I saw Deadpool. I liked it. If you like the first one, you'll like the second one. If you hated the first one, you'll hate the second one. That's my review. There we go. No spoilers. I don't think that's a spoiler. Okay, so the po- the Facebook thing, Facebook changed something. Okay. And they asked me to go in and do something <laughs> about permissions. Something? Yeah, it's their okay. API. Okay. Their API thing. And so whatever, and it might just, I have no idea how that could have happened, but it, it may just do it again this week. But it's supposed to, my, there's a thing on our website that's supposed to send the most recent podcast to Facebook. Yes. And Twitter yes. and all the places. Yeah, so went, once you make a post on our avrant.com yes. website, it automatically posts on Facebook and Twitter just to let people know. And for that, you need like a bot API thing. Right. And I've set that up many moons ago and they have made some changes to it and they asked me to okay some changes or mm-hmm. something. And I, I, I tried to go in there and understand what the heck they were talking about. And it's all in like techno babble okay. programmer geek language. And I don't understand any of it. So when you and I can maybe go through it afterwards we can take a look at it but uh i ignored it okay. <laughs> hoping it would just be fine yep. because we're not doing anything funny like they were asking me do you do you do, does your api need permission to post on other people's websites i'm like dude just leave it the way it was right, it's fine right, right. it's there's nothing so i guess that's why it did what it did I yeah, guess for for just to clue anyone in, because if you don't follow us on Facebook or Twitter, you wouldn't have seen it. But we we blast- it did it on Twitter too. Yeah, it did it on Twitter too. Yeah, I blasted oh. out a message saying, uh, "Hello world, uh, we're AV Rant Podcast. This is our first ever WordPress like posting. Uh, just letting you know we have this new blog and like welcome to our website." And so some people were like, "That's oh, like this, hello." That, that's the. T- I was wondering why people. I thought somebody had gone back and found our very first post or something. Nope, like that. that just automatically went up there on. on there, Twitter it could Facebook. also be that there is a the app that does this uh-huh. needs an update. So I'm checking uh-huh. that right now to see if that's the case. <laughs> sidetracked. I'm not getting sidetracked. You're talking. So okay. getting sidetracked. WordPress to Twitter. Okay, uh-huh. so and that needs to be updated. This is but that's fantastic all I podcasting, see. even on YouTube, it's riveting. Watching Tom read a website. Uh, you know what? No one likes you that much. You're just a disagreeable Canadian. <laughs> I didn't even know such a thing existed, mm. but apparently it does. All right. This is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us a question at avrant.com. You go to www.avrant.com and uh, leave us a comment there. Facebook.com slash podcast, YouTube.com slash avrant, where you can leave a comment that we will ignore, but we are happy to have you watch our videos that are two hours long and are date stamped. So if any of the information <laughs> is out of date, look at the date stamp, please. Uh, you can also email us directly or contact us directly, rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at first, uh, at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. And on June 2nd, Lee Overstreet will be in my home. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I thought you were going to say you're away and just like tell him this way. But no, okay, nope. that's cool. Lee will be here. Cool. That is, that is a Saturday, I hope. Whatever Saturday is closest to June 2nd is the Saturday that he will be in my house. (laughs) He is coming to the area, and I was like, yeah, yeah, dude, come over for dinner. We'll hang out. So he wants a demo of the home theater, which means I guess I have to paint. I have to finish painting. I probably won't. Let's just be really honest here. Lee's not the type of guy who's going to hold that against you. Yeah, he's probably going to talk about it a lot, to be honest with you, after how much flack I've given him about his stupid non-subwoofer issue, (laughs) his full-range Garbo speakers. Um... Yeah, so Lee Overstreet's going to come over, cool. and that's going to be interesting. And if you don't know who he is, he occasionally fills in for me. I was going to say, and sometimes Rob, but really just me on the podcast when uh, I am indisposed, sick, and or dealing with children. Mm-hmm. So that'll be exciting. 
Uh, we want to start this uh, podcast off as we always do by thanking our listeners of the week. To become a listener of the week, all you have to do is support the podcast in one in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to www.avrant.com and clicking, clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link. Those of you that are longtime listeners or have been listening for at least a week will know that last week we had a, a listener drive, a donation pledge drive, where three of our listeners uh, offered to match pledges or dry, uh, donations up to $100 each. So that was a total of $300, which we did reach. So thank you to all of our listeners from last week. And I understand we have a couple of corrections, Rob. Yeah. Um, yeah. What happened was uh, Tom was reading out the names of the donors. I was writing them down and I got a little bit confused because one person's last name started with A and the next person's first name started with A and I kind of combined them accidentally. So I wanted to apologize and say to Grant A, whom we called Grant S. So it's actually Grant a and then Amar S, who we missed entirely because I somehow rolled your first name into Grant's last name and your ah. last initial into Grant's last initial. So Grant, Amar, thank you for the donations. Sorry we messed up your names. My fault. I misheard and typed wrong. So trying to correct that. Yes, and we want to thank. I think I did. We did mention them last week, but we'll mention them again. Dale, who came in right uh, past the wire, so <laughs> didn't quite make it into the to the matching pledge. But we do a. a Appreciate your donation, and thank you, Dale, for that donation. Yeah, Dale, you get to be a, a sole listener of the week this week. So, so there you Where'd go. You That's go? the benefit. That's the benefit. <laughs> we also want to thank our 61 patrons over at Patreon. Patreon's a service where you could subscribe to uh, give to your content creator that you love so much, which in this case would be us. And once a month, they take out whatever you have uh, decided that we are worth a month. I think the, the minimum is a dollar and the maximum is all of the money that you own. Sky's the limit. So we want to thank our 61 patrons for... From uh, Patreon, thank you, yeah. gentlemen and ladies. I yeah, want to believe uh, there are some ladies that are doing. You know this what? Stuff. I've I've had a couple of Twitter messages from. Well, they appear to be female names, so uh, so I'm, I'm going out on a limb there. But yeah, so very entirely yeah. possible. patreoncom slash podcast. Thank you so much to our 61 patrons. Right. So I'm not going to get too sidetracked, but. Is there anything neat going on with you, Rob? Anything, any oh. AV related news you would like to nope. share with us? Nope, haven't bought anything or changed anything recently. So, was I supposed to? Is that like a no, leading I'm just question? asking. I don't know. Could be. <laughs> I have had so many people ask me about Bluetooth speakers lately. Uh -huh. like they, I'm like the go to guy. Like, hey, remember that Bluetooth speaker you gave me? It doesn't work as well anymore. You got another one? Like, what do you think I got? Yeah, actually, I do have another one. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. I haven't it. I haven't heard them yet, but Fluence has a new pair of uh, kind of oh, yeah? expensive bookshelf speakers. It might be worth checking out. Yeah. No, we should do that. Yeah. All right. In the news, uh, Yamaha announced their new Avantage receivers. Last year's lineup, uh, where all the model numbers ended with a 70, uh, you, if you change that to an 80, you pretty much have this year's lineup. They have yeah. changed almost nothing. Almost nothing. It's very, very similar. So the only new feature is something Yamaha is calling Surround AI because if Yamaha needed anything, it was another surround mode. <laughs> Everybody knows that. They claim this is an artificial intelligence sound technology that supposedly analyzes the content that is playing and adjusts levels on the fly to make dialogue easier to understand. Yeah, uh -huh. I'm sure they needed AI for that, and it's not just like it's a mid-range boost. not really AI. They even described it as like, oh, it compares it to a library of existing content to decide to remaster, because apparently the people who mastered the audio didn't know what they were doing, so we're going to remaster it via an automated process, and comparing what's playing to an existing library, that's not artificial intelligence. That's an algorithm. Yeah. But anyway. you can call it whatever you want. Sure. Uh, it's only on their top three models, the 1080, 2080, and 3080. And the only model that can do 11 speakers is their flagship. It's a $2,200, the 3080. But it really can only, it only comes with nine amps. So you got to get another amp and a couple of, a couple yeah. of channels to do it. But so that's it. I mean, I guess the, the one hand, the happy side is if you go back two years and you bought a, uh, you know, a one that ended in a 60 or last year you bought one that ended in a 70, you're really not feeling like you're missing out. You don't have yeah. any upgrade itis from these because 
nothing really changed. On the other hand, it's like everyone else has an 11 speaker model. I kudos to Onkyo this year for bringing out a, a nine speaker model at a new price point that like $800 MSRP means for at accessories for less in like less than a year, that's going to be down to $500 or lower. Yeah. Guaranteed. yeah, 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 yeah and that's going to be, that's going to be a new price barrier. We didn't, we haven't had a 5.2.4 capable receiver at $500 before. So kudos to Onkyo for that. But Yamaha, it's like, nope, we're keeping what we got. Well, if you're a Yamaha fan, the upside is that you don't have to worry about buying anything this year, and yeah. next year will probably be a big year for Yamaha. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I mean hey, it, I, I still think happening. they're very good receivers. It's just oh, yeah. they're, they're starting to fall behind the feature yeah. race a little bit. So, yeah. we'll I would imagine next year is going to be huge for them. So probably. We'll yeah. have to wait till then. Uh, Nathan let us know that as of this weekend, Oppo is completely out of 203 and 205 Ultra HD Blu-ray players. However, they've put up a last batch page where you can register to be notified when one of their last production runs becomes available. They already had plans in place for a final batch of 205 player in August. The final batch of 203 players was just added today with no projected ETA as of yet. So there's two pages, one for each one. So if you want mm -hmm. one of those, get on the list now. Yeah, otherwise, I mean, there there are already like 205 and 203 units being sold at ridiculous yeah. markups. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. We had a listener just last week who talked That's to right. us after the podcast who had bought one of the last 205s and then sold it at enough yeah. of a profit to buy like a receiver. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> a brand new receiver from Accessories for Less. I don't want I mean, my 203 to go away, but maybe I should sell the thing. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. Yeah, you can make some <laughs> make some bucks. Uh, the Laurel versus Yanni yeah. uh, debate might have come and gone already, which I, I like completely missed. Oh, okay. Well, you're not on Twitter very much, so that's, I am not. that's where it blew up. But not many people discovered the Brainstorm versus Green Needle audio illusion, or thanks to Richard Gunther, one of our listeners who tweeted about it uh basically if, if any of you are in the dark about what this is it's extremely degraded audio oh, that yeah. has lots of problems with it that yeah it's a you, distorted robot voice right that if you listen to it with one word in your mind you will hear that word if you listen to it with the other word in your mind you'll hear that word yeah so yanni versus laurel uh and they've also shown that with a lot the yanni versus laurel if you have high-end hearing loss You'll only hear one. I don't remember which one. It yeah, was. you'll only hear. Yeah, uh, let's see. I thought it was Laurel. You no, know, it's yeah. You'll only hear Laurel if you can't. If you're not, well, so here's the thing. I tested my hearing. Now I can't hear much above 18 kilohertz anymore. Well, that's. I think you have to be lower than that. I'm though. only. Th I'm over 35, but I can hear 18 kilohertz still. So, yeah. but I only hear Laurel until it's like the whole thing is pitched downward, manipulated downward, and mm. then I'll hear the anything come out. But I, I can like even if I'm. Here, you know, picturing in my mind ahead of time, yanny, yanny, yanny. I can only hear Laurel on that one, so I don't exactly know what's going on there. The the brainstorm versus Green Needle one, totally. Whatever I'm thinking in my mind, that's the one I hear. That one very, totally works. Yeah, very it's bizarre. weird. It's it is bizarre. weird. It's off putting. Like it's but, not like the brain and the green. That's so garbled that that's easy to mix yeah, up. But the yeah. like storm versus needle, and it's so clearly one or the other, depending <laughs> on which one you're thinking. I'm like, that's. I mean, you can you can hear a green storm or brain needle quite easily. Yeah, but uh, yeah, the storm versus needle. That's that's interesting. Audio illusions, cool stuff. But I, I, this really goes to show, at least to me, whenever you are going to a high end dealer to listen to speakers, why they always talk to you beforehand, mm. why they always tell you what you're going to yeah, hear, they prime you, because that's exactly what they're doing. They're they're playing upon this. This I put this in your head, therefore you will hear it. Mm -hmm. That's why whenever I, I try not to get, let those guys talk at all but they <laughs> insist then i try to hear the opposite of what they're saying in my mind so that if i actually hear it then i'm like okay well yeah yeah i guess it, there was something there but uh it, it's all part it's all part and parcel of the same phenomenon which is your you can your brain's stupid <laughs> you know, it can be tricked and even if you know it's being tricked it can still be tricked it can still be tricked. yeah That's uh right. ju just in case anyone's wondering objectively the robot voices are saying laurel and brainstorm those are the words that the robot voice was programmed to say uh, the, right. the illusion is that you might hear yanny or green needle instead right all right, some comments from some listeners. Roger, just thought it might be helpful to share a graph of the Fletcher Munson loud, equal loudness contours to help people visualize why the volume of bass frequencies needs to be increased as we decrease the overall volume level in order for us to perceive the full frequency response as remaining flat. So if you are watching us on YouTube, 
Uh, Rob, you got to remind me to put this into the show notes because I'm going to forget. But uh, I'll try to remember to put it into the show notes. Or at least let's link it up somehow. That's what we'll have to do. Which is that? The, the, oh, this the, thing? This graph. Oh, yes. okay, yes. So the, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're seeing the graph. But basically what you're seeing is that as the volume goes down, in order for everything to be uh, about the same, set to perception, for you to perceive it to be the same loudness, uh, the bass has to go way up. Uh, in volume. Particularly the very lowest line, which is showing the minimum audible level. Yeah. You'll notice that down at 20 hertz, it's got to be like almost 80 decibels before you can even hear it. <laughs> That's so, right. So uh, we'll actually be talking about dynamic EQ later on in the podcast. Right, right, right. That That is uh, one like of the... Right after this, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, that's the first question. That is one of the major things that dynamic EQ does is it attempts to keep everything audible. Not necessarily completely perceptually flat in response, but right. audible. So, so if, if 20 hertz is going to be audible, it's got to be playing at like 75 dB. When the Odyssey guys were talking about this, they used this, but not just this. They did their yeah. own. They they yeah. they played sweeps and had people manual, many people manually adjust things right. until they perceived it as as perceptually. They had sound flat. engineers come in. They had a bunch of yeah. other you know other professional people who you know mix sound for a living come in and say you know where is the, where does everything sound the same to you right. and then they took all that plus this and came up with a with a curve that they believe is the best curve yeah so it's a little bit of it's not just this and then throwing it into a, a an algorithm and then using bass boost or using boost based on this it was other stuff as well with odyssey Dynamics. yeah and uh, yamaha has a similar thing they call it y pow volume Right, uh, and that is again. They sort of took Dolby the Fletcher had one too, right? Didn't they have Dol They didn't have the. They had the the volume, but that was just to make things all sound the same. Uh, it actually did volume. include a uh, a bit of a dynamic EQ type of thing as I well. I remember volume, yeah. them ever having that anywhere. It might have been like in one Onkyo. Yeah. Receiver oh, I have there. an Onkyo that had it, and Anthem. Anthem is the one that has ah. has deployed Dolby volume, and they've done the excellent version, which is separating the two things, separating the dynamic range compression and the. Uh, dynamic equalization. They've separated those two things. You can activate them individually on Anthem. Right. Infinite Gary bought a pair of the new Revel Performa B... B-E? Do we can B Yeah, B-E B? for Beryllium. B-E, yeah. yeah. Series bookshelf speakers. Unfortunately, in his case, he wasn't terribly impressed with their sound. He found them sterile and lacking in uh, lower mid-range, and when he attempted to in EQ them a bit, he thought their sound just became muddled. He actually preferred the considerably less expensive Re Revel Performa 3 series speakers. Oops, uh, something just happened. Uh, <laughs> even in the upper treble where he expected the new Beryllium tweeter to make the most difference. And for expanding to seven speakers in this dedicated theater, he settled on getting another pair of Dynaudio bookshelves to match his existing Dynaudio surrounds. So, yeah, just because something costs more than means better. And in this case, auditioning in his home, in his setup, absolutely convinced him that these speakers were not right for him. And yeah, and he, he tried them in several different rooms and several different yeah. setups with several different, uh, you know, uh, amplifiers driving them. So he gave them a good go. Uh, now... He tried Revel because he actually ended up changing out his Dyn Audio Center for a Revel Ultima 2 Center right. that he preferred in that case. So, you know, it's it's not a brand loyalty thing, but uh, yeah, just, just an example. I, I, had, I was interested in these new Revel Performa BE Series speakers. Uh, I might have an entirely different opinion of them. Who knows? But that's, that's right. Gary's take, and I appreciate it. David. Last week, David asked us for a solution for the super slow HDMI switching and handshaking of his JVC projector. We suggested using an HD Fury linker. Mm -hmm. Rob suggested this. I had I no did. idea what to do. <laughs> I was completely clueless. David went ahead and bought the more expensive Vertex model, just in case there was some unforeseen, unforeseen future uh, he might need uh, or find useful. Unfortunately, the Vertex did not solve the issue, and when he changes channels on his DirecTV box, going from 720 uh, to a 720 channel to a 1080i channel, or vice versa, there's still a new HDMI handshake all the way up the signal chain, causing the long blanking on his JVC projector until the signal is renegotiated. Mm -hmm. David wanted to further warn everyone that even though the linker and vertex are touted as offering scaling up to 4k resolution they actually only scale between 1080p 
and 4K. There's no scaling, scaling for lower resolutions like 720p and no deinterlacing. Anything other than 1080p is just passed right through. Yeah. So D David uh, uses a Denon X4300H receiver so he can plug all the sources into that and have the Denon scale and deinterlace everything and then let the HD Fury uh, handle any HDCP, HDR, or Chroma sampling stuff. But for everyone else, just be forewarned that the HD Fury products are quite limited in terms of their resolution scaling capabilities. And while you can choose all sorts of output options, they don't actually remain locked all the time. They're processing the incoming signal on the fly, meaning they're still doing new HDMI handshakes with each incoming signal change. So, so some things that I had presumed that I was completely wrong about. I thought they yeah. were locking the output yeah. signal, but it turns out it seems it's like, strange no. that they're not. To be honest with you, it really doesn't. Well, because see, that's kind of the way it's described in the literature. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, I don't understand why you wouldn't just. I mean, if if you know that's going to be output the resolution, why wouldn't you just lock it in and not? It would help. But, uh, what, but no, I mean, what's the big deal with de interlacing? You're spending how much for these freaking boxes? De interlacing is not exactly bucks. the hardest thing. You know, it's yeah, not. So. It's, it's not expensive. They they should do all that. They should take any signal and put it up to 4K. I mean, there's like, you know, every DVD player on the market does it, and some of them cost <laughs> less than this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they could have even done it a cheaper. Maybe it's not the best scaler and in interlacer, but at least had it. But no, it just it doesn't. So it's 1080p to 4K, or you can actually go down from 4K to 1080p. But it's mostly about handling the HDCP copy protection issues. You know, translating between right. 2.2 and 1.4, and then um, injecting or removing HDR metadata to trick your display to do one thing or the other. Uh, does all that stuff really well, but doesn't do the thing that he needed, which is just lock the signal in so his JVC mm. doesn't keep trying to handshake. So unfortunately. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a solution for this. I mean, I'll be I, honest with you. The, the solution is to take your, your cable box and put it in the lowest possible and well, lock it in. We, we've, I talked with him on Twitter about it, and he, he tried everything. He's like, you know. I he, believe him. Yeah, I believe he, him. So I'm like, the only thing you do is you could talk to DirecTV and see if there's a different cable box model, you know, yeah. a different TV box model that you could try that maybe doesn't do a new handshake with every change of the resolution of the original signal. Like you can set it to always output 1080i. It has that right. option or always output 720p, but it still does the handshake every time the channel That's changes. Ridiculous. Which is yeah. ridiculous. So I don't know. Maybe there's if you can't get it done in the source, I don't I don't have another solution. If anyone else does, please let us know because I'm I've exhausted my knowledge on this. And yeah. I was wrong about the HD Furies. So I, I apologize. I uh, hope you bought it from some place you can return it to. Yes. Francis on Facebook. He's very curious about our most recent Facebook post. Francis bought a Marantz SR7010 receiver. He's currently running a 6.2 setup with uh, BMW M1 satellite speakers all around and dual SVS PB1000 subs. He's planning to expand to Atmos in the not-too-distant future, but first... This is his first time using Odyssey Multi QXT32 with sub EQHT. It got him to reduce the output of each sub before auto calibration began. Each sub read 75 on the on screen display, but after everything was done, he found the bass to be lacking. Furthermore, he set the cross it set the crossover frequencies for his front left and right speakers to 120 hertz, his center to 80 hertz, and his surrounds to 150 hertz. Isn't that too high? Can we please help him run Odyssey properly and achieve good results? These are itty bitty speakers. They are. They're satellite <laughs> yeah. speakers. I mean, the I, name don't, says. I, I don't know that this is too high. I'll be honest with you. Uh, it's, if anything, the 80 hertz for the center is too low. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're getting some uh, some bass boost off oh, of yeah. it being on that 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 uh, cabinet that you have. And on. having the television right behind it possibly too. So there's some boundary right. reinforcement going on. You there. are getting that. And I think that the, the 120 sounds about right. The 150 yep. sounds a little wonky but i can't see his surround that could be speakers, because so. maybe they're a little bit slightly elevated so there's yeah. maybe a little high frequency roll off or something like that it could be off axis to a little off know, axis could, that that, yeah. that happens that's very common yeah. i i as far as your base uh i mean if you set each sub to right read 75 and then you found that you wanted some more base yeah well, yeah that's fine there's nothing oh, yeah. wrong with that that's that's many people many many yeah. people i would encourage you to turn on dynamic eq first yes. and give that yes. a try now that's not necessarily going to give you the results you're looking for if it doesn't by all means you can manually increase Goose you can it. you can turn up the volume knobs or you can increase the trim level and that's what we'll be talking about again later as well right which we're going to talk about right now because he's asked what okay. is odyssey dynamic eq and as go. we said what it does is it tries to keep the base the same perceptual volume as the rest of the frequencies 
as you change absolute volume on the knob. So as you turn down the knob, go your uh, master your base knob. your master bobby volume knob your bass has to come up in order to perce- you you to perceive it as being the same loudness as the rest of the so if you just left if it was just a straight line and as you lowered the volume everything lowered at the exact same you would find that the bass would disappear yeah before the rest of the sounds would disappear yeah like going back to those fletcher munson curves right you know w- one thing that could happen like let's say at full reference volume, there's a uh, a low bass note, 25 hertz or 20 hertz bass note in the signal at full reference volume that's supposed to be playing at 85 decibels or 90 decibels or something. You'd be right. able to hear that at full reference volume, but let's say you're listening at minus 20 on the master volume dial, and a lot of people do. That That's a common setting is, you know, minus 20. Uh, at that point, that same signal is saying, oh, it's only playing at 65 or 70 decibels. Uh, right. Which, according to the Fletcher Munster curves, you literally might not hear at all. Right. So dynamic EQ is saying, okay, I now understand that you're at minus 20 below reference volume. That means if a bass sound at 25 hertz or 20 hertz comes in and it's only going to be 65 hertz, I know to boost that up to 80 hertz or uh, decibels, sorry, not hertz. I know to boost that up to 80 decibels so that at least you can hear it instead of it just completely disappearing on you. Right. Uh, so yeah, so the the crossover frequencies, I mean... Oh, I thought we were done with that one. Yeah. I mean, uh, just leave it. I mean, I would... I mean, for the most part, I think 120 hertz, hertz would, is fine. <laughs> I, I would put the, the center to 120 hertz as well, but the yeah. uh, the 150s I would leave. Uh, probably. Prob- probably because of the the roll-off there. That yeah, you're, you're it could also be the like the, the front speakers, they are closer to that front wall that is behind them sure. than, you know, the surround speaker looks like it's just kind of out in open air. So yeah. there might be some bass reinforcement going on from the front wall for the front speakers. That could also be an effect here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the 120 hertz is entirely reasonable. That is not too high. 150 yeah. hertz is probably okay. Um, yeah, that's verging on becoming a little bit too high, but right around 120. Surra- it's, they're surround speakers anyways. That's really true. Cares. I'd probably set everything to 120 <laughs> hertz in your case and be done with it. Yeah, if you had a global crossover, I right. would set it to 120 yep. and go. But since you have individual crossovers, I would change everything to 120, except for your surrounds. I would leave those at 150. You could change it to 120. You're not yep. going to hurt my feelings. And, and probably never like. notice it, because how often yeah. does stuff in the surrounds really do like a bass sweep on you? Um, not yeah. often. Chad. Chad B. And I now believe his name is really... Is this Chad Boz... Boswick? Boswick? What's his name? The Black Panther guy? Oh, uh, Chadwick Boseman? That's it. That's who this guy is. Could be. Chadwick Boseman. He's I really Black don't Panther. think it is. I think we saw his full name and it's not him. I'm the Black Panther. <laughs> you gotta say it like that. I'm, I'm the Black Panther. Okay. Did he ever it, do that? Did he ever do the Batman voice? I don't remember that. No, he just he doesn't do the Batman voice. Why would he do the Batman voice? He's from like South Africa or whatever and he's got that cool accent. So, no. Um... Chat, uh, the Black Panther says he's been out of the home theater game for a while since he was uh, living in a condo where he couldn't really set up a theater space. But now he's moving, uh, moving into a house. And although he doesn't have a dedicated theater room yet, he's eager to bust out some of his older gear and set up a theater area in his living room. He has a bunch of pro audio gear and figures he can still make use of it for the time being. Original M and K S one hundred and fifty monitors. Those are the ones that I looked at a long time ago. Uh, those are the ones that sit on the ground, right? That, that angle? Are those the angle Oh, ones? they can. I mean, they were meant to be wall-mounted, by and yeah. large. There were the ones that were just straight on. Those are the ones that have the three tweeters vertically aligned yeah, yeah. with a little bit of foam in between each tweeter. What's uh, Is this a design of what's-his-name? Because who used to design for M&K forever. What is his name? Vance Dickinson? That's it, yes. Uh, is this I don't know if those design? were his designs. These were the speakers that are used at, like, uh, Skywalker yeah. Sound. Right. Yeah. These are perfectly i mean I, I you're like oh well i've just got these old speakers these are really nice old for home no, theater these are, in particular these yeah, are great no, these, these are like literally the speakers that were used to make a lot of movie soundtracks yeah, yeah. Uh, he's got dual danley cs30 12 inch subs i've never heard of those crown and crest pro amps and the onkyo sc uh, 886 7.1 pre-pro so we need some surround speakers. So can we suggest anything that would nicely match with this M and K monitors? The spots where he would mount spe- surround speakers are quite high up. The s- ceiling is slanted, so it is higher on the left and lower on the right. But there are some soffits with lighting in them. He was thinking he could just mount the speakers to the sides of those soffits, 
putting the speaker somewhere slightly above seven feet off the ground. Would SVS prime elevation uh, speakers work well? Is there something much better we suggest instead? Now, there's a picture that you may be seeing on uh, Facebook. Uh, I mean, on Facebook, on YouTube here, uh, where he's sort of drawn in where everything is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is nice. And I think that these looks like a pretty good place for um, surround speakers. speakers. Yeah, I, I like I like what you've done here, sir. And yeah, I think I mean, prime elevation would the... work well with the uh, the M and Ks are going to yeah. be pretty neutral. So oh, very yeah. They're really the only thing you have to worry about is getting a non neutral sounding speaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, the prime elevations will would work well in this regard. Uh, you could there's almost anything that we normally recommend would be fine. Like I mean, you could go NHTs, you could go uh, CAFs, you could go uh, RVHs in particular. RVHs would be great. There's there's a lot of stuff here that would work just fine, and the the prime elevations, if those are the ones that you have your eye on, I would say you've got your eye in the right spot. Yeah, I mean, I would say that um, like if someone just came to me and said, I have original M and K speakers, uh, what's a good brand I could buy today that would match? I would point you to Ascend uh, because David Fabricant got his start making speakers right. at M and K. Uh, That's true and so well. he entirely bought into the very neutral frequency response. So uh, Ascend speakers match very nicely with the original MKs. The the new MK sound that took over a completely different company and that they've they've changed some things. Uh, yeah, but original yeah. MKs Ascends would match very well. So like the uh, HTM 200 SEs would be a great match. However, for this mounting idea, which I agree for your surround speakers on the left and right with a kind of open-ish space like this and a nice high ceiling, totally makes sense, prime elevations. Uh, and yeah. as far as elevated surround speakers would go, I'd have zero qualms with that. So I think that's a good plan. So if he goes for seven speakers, he could have the surround backs on speaker stands behind his couch. Is there some flat speaker wire that he could run under his rug to go from his amps up front to behind his uh, seats? Yeah, there's tons of flat speaker wire, so you want to get the cheapest stuff, which I'm sure Rob will tell you where it is. The only thing I'm going to uh, caution you against is when you run speaker wire underneath carpets, you have to worry about those tack strips, mm. you know, the little nails that come up. So well, this is a to... rug, not carpet. So Right. So uh, as long as it's the rug and that you're not going through the carpet, you should be just fine. Yeah. Uh, so if you want inexpensive stuff that I would recommend, I'd go just go over to Parts Express. Uh, mm -hmm. You could literally just search for flat speaker wire and uh, some will come up and it's it's entirely usable. It's paintable if you wanted to run it up a wall or something instead um, or along a ceiling. You can paint it and, and it'll yeah. blend right in. Now, it it still has some depth to it. You know, it's not literally completely flat if you want the very flattest speaker wire i have ever come across uh axiom audio sells like the flattest speaker wire I've ever seen but it's axiom so they overcharge for it uh so what what's the price on there right now they used to be a value leader those guys Remember they that? sure did i i think it's like so, it's between two and three dollars a foot i know it's Definitely over two dollars. Well, wait, hold on. Well, that's got to be the Canadian yeah. price. No, U.S. dollars, four dollars a foot. Holy cow! Yeah. It went up again. Last time I looked at it, it was under three. Okay, it's real good though. You know, it's the best. Well, it's it's it is Canadian exceedingly wire. flat. Uh, that that uh, of that there is no debate. But four dollars a foot is kind of crazy because I'm pretty sure you can get what is it a hundred feet of the uh, Parts Express flat speaker wire for let's see a hundred feet is uh, thirty seven dollars. <laughs> that's considerably less than four dollars a foot by my math less. so by yes my math that's it, 37 cents a foot it, it has a little bit of depth but as far as like if you're worried that it's going to make a bump under your rug no it's not that yeah. kind of depth it's just it when it's running along the part of your floor that is not covered by a rug yeah there's, there's a little a little bit of depth to it of course there has to be uh but yeah the two options yeah. there one vastly more expensive than the other Oh, wait, I already read that one. Another option would be to mount the surround back speakers on the soffits, just like the surround speakers. And since he thinks 7.2.4 setup would be amazing, he's toying with the idea of mounting front height speakers on the soffits too. But what do we think? Is 7.2.4 even worth considering in this room? And if so, what do we think would be the best way to arrange and mount all the speakers? I'll be honest with you, dude. This is a open concept, whatever the heck it is, thing that you got going on. Yeah, it's I'd kind set of up your, I'd, I'd set up your 7 point and then just live with it for a little while and then come back to us i i feel like i i'd be honest with you i'd set i'd set up a five point 
the 5.2 <laughs> and then live with it for a while and then come back and say, well, this is all locked in. It sounds really good. I, now I want to add some surround backs or I want to try some height speakers or I want to try some this or that. Um, I feel like... Yeah, especially given that the, uh, that, that the pre-pro you already own is a 7.1 pre-pro. It's not an Atmos pre-pro. Yeah. So... I, I would agree. Get get your seven point one or or five point one going first, um, and then you know that'll give you a chance to get used to the new space, get used to your audio within that space. Maybe right. address some things which is coming up in a, uh, another question as far as the acoustics of the room goes. And then after all of that, maybe you start worrying about adding height speakers. Um, yeah. However, if you do, I mean, just looking at the layout what he's proposed as his front height location and surround back location if he were to mount the surround back on the soffits. I mean, those could be front heights and rear heights, and then you could have your surround back speakers on stands behind your seats as you proposed in the last question with the flat speaker right. wire. So th there is a way to do 7.2.4 in here. I don't think it's out of the question at all, uh, but I would just say let's let's get everything else well under control first and then yeah, he's maybe got, add the heights after. I don't know. Are you showing this picture on the YouTube thing? I was, yes, yeah. Okay. I mean, I well, he's got both of his subs up front, you know, That's basically true. right on the inside of both of his, his, his main speakers there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have no idea how this is going to sound in this room. Might sound perfect. Yeah. Uh, these these subs, uh, I, I went to their webpage. It's like 30, they advertise 120 decibels at 33 hertz. I'm like, yeah. Yay, I guess is what I'm supposed to say to that. But uh, these are pro uh, subs. You can tell they're like carpeted. <laughs> you know, they got handles in the top. Yeah. And uh, they don't come with an amp, which is what he, why he mentioned those amps That's earlier. Right. So uh, these could sound amazing here and in, in this location, but we won't know until you get this set up. I would go with getting your surrounds and your... Let's put it this way. If you put surrounds sort of in perfect surround-ish location and they are up, they're the prime elevation speakers that okay. you were talking about doing. If you decided later on to do something else and when it, you could actually turn those into top middles Very easily. and then yeah. put speakers closer to the ground. Mm. So mount those guys and call them surrounds for now mm -hmm. and then you won't be wasting any money you can still do atmos later you could do those plus front heights and bob's your uncle you're out that is you also do, true yeah i agree yeah and the you know i mean and then you could put speakers on stands flanking your couch to be your surrounds later on yep that's if true you so decided so i that's what i would do i would do that okay and then live with this for a little while and see how things sound because he's got a it looks like to the on his right he's got a big old long window i'm guessing yes or maybe a sliding glass door yeah and the left side he's thinking about putting some acoustic panels so and there's but there's also window on the left side and then it's open in the back but there might be something behind him which may or may not be a wall i can't really tell what that yeah. is <laughs> yeah, so, some kind of division yeah. yeah so maybe you could put speakers there on top of there or near there or mount it to there i don't know so 5.2 and stop and then we'll see that's my that's my suggestion all right uh, here we go. He has sliding doors on the left wall of his... That's, a, that's sli on the left wall? Yeah, the left room? wall over there, so that what we can see in the drawing there, those are... He has them labeled as pull doors, but yeah, sl sliding doors there in that opening. Where? Where's it like pull doors? I don't see this. The the one where you can see the, the blue drawn, drawn on the white. Oh, hold on. Is it above here? Yeah, Oh, going up there. Yeah, pull so doors. Pull oh, doors. okay, yeah. I see. I see, That's I see, right. I see. So that other stuff must be windows. That's right. All right. So uh, let me go back. He has some sliding doors on the left one. How badly would those rattle? How old are those doors? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go push on them. Do they rattle? That's how bad they can rattle. <laughs> I mean, that's basically it. Don't except instead of you pushing on them, it's going to be your subwoofers. And honestly, I don't know if your subwoofers are going to do a lot or a little to these things. Mm. And it, you're going to find it's probably going to be very specific frequencies that do it, anyways. So you could have no problems with your current subs, and then later on, you're like, "Hey, I'm going to upgrade and get and a, sub 20 hertz bass in here." That's right. And suddenly, you're going to be rattling the crap out of those things. So, but a little a little rubber tape, I don't know, along whatever edge is rattling, can take care of that for largely. Yeah, but if they're sliding doors. That's not going to work, dude. No, but I mean, if that's... it's at at the point where they meet. You know, in the if middle. it is, but I think those doors are going to rattle on the wheels. No. You know, they're going to, they're not going to be just like rattling in the jam mm. like normal doors mm. were. They would, they could, they'd be rattling on everywhere. And it, every time you slid this thing open, you'd be tearing that, that could tape be. up. You could try. We don't know. 
but we don't the answer to the question is we'll all found, find out when we set this thing up <laughs> So he's going to attempt to put acoustic panels wherever he can. He'll have curtains over the large windows on the right. So he's planned out some spots on the left uh, wall and front wall and partition towards the back of the room. There's a partition or something back there. He'll put a rug in front of his couch and the other ideas. Yeah, uh, I don't know how heavy you think those those <laughs> those, those curtains are going to be. They ain't heavy enough. So if there's any way that you could put a panel that you could maybe move, you could put it on that right free side. Freestanding, sure. A freestanding one and just... Push it out of the way when you're not when you're not in there. That would be a good idea as well. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that those those windows on the right are far enough back that the first reflection point is probably going to bounce it behind you and into some other space. So it may not be as much of an issue than if if it had that first reflection point would be right towards you. So I would, um, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be. Well, I mean, by definition, cool. there's going to be some angle where it'll bounce off of the side and to your seat. It's going to be quite a steep angle in your it's case. It's going to be a real steep angle, given, yeah, given the be, uh, distances. I, I, but but yeah, yeah, there will there will be some. But I would I would say another place to consider uh, adding some absorption would actually be on. It looks as though there's a um, space on top of the soffit, at least on the left side. Oh, you're looking at the different a different picture. Of the yeah, no, if you look again at the drawing with the with the blue things on it. Uh, yep. above that left soffit there appears to be another window and it looks like there's like space on top of that left soffit possibly on top of the right soffit too uh, we don't have a view of that uh, so even though you won't see that and it won't be affecting any direct reflections uh, what it'll be doing is sucking up any reverberance in the room in a way that's completely visually hidden right. so just just having some absorption on top of either or both of the soffits that's a way to just add some kind of base trapping uh, suck up any echoes that are happening in that room yeah just anywhere dude <laughs> behind your speakers if, I mean, if you can but uh right there's a panel on the left wall there it'd be nice if there could be a panel i don't really know it's gonna be right in front of that door so i don't see that really happening but we'll see i have to scroll back down now because you, you kept making me scroll back up <laughs> is that it for him that's, that's it, it. nelson nelson wants to make sure he's maximizing his hdmi connection path his tv is a b7 OLED and he wants to use some of its built-in apps like Netflix so that he gets both Dolby Vision and Atmos. His receiver is a Denon S730H, so using HDMI ARC from his B7 to his Denon gets Atmos working from the B7's internal apps. But then he also has an Oppo 203 and NVIDIA Shield and Xbox. At the moment, he plugs the Oppo's HDMI input to the Denon and he plugs an NVIDIA Shield into the Oppo to take advantage of the Oppo's video processing. Is this the very best connection path or should his Oppo be somewhere else in the signal chain? Should he maybe put the Oppo between the receiver and the TV so that all of his sources can take advantage of the Oppo's video processing? But if he does that, will ARC still work to send audio from his TV's internal amps though through the Oppo and to his receiver? Uh, you see, I don't really think you need to put anything anywhere other than where you would normally put it <laughs> this is an oppo 203 i mean it's it fine it is, is is it's got great video processing not that you probably ever need it because you're probably putting blu-rays in it or ultra hd blu-rays in it or whatever it is uh you have an nvidia shield which is basically a computer which has as far as i know great great upscaling and all that other stuff you can definitely be set to output 4k yep for sure and you have an xbox which other than the audio, the video has never been really much of an issue. Yeah. So I would just plug them all into your Denon and be done with it, to be honest with you. I don't know that you need to put anything through your Oppo. I don't know that it's going to be really doing all that much unless you are outputting 1080i from the Xbox. Or what would the NVIDIA Shield even send it that it would need to do something to? Because I, mean, I, I think the chances are it's already got its scale to the right resolution. Yeah. So, so I guess I guess it, he's thinking that like let's say the source he's watching is 1080p or 720p or something like that he could set the Nvidia yeah, but, Shield to output that at its native resolution and then have right. the Oppo do the upscaling. Although I mean even if you really? output from the Nvidia Shield at 1080p the B7 is going to upscale on its own and it has very good video upscaling <laughs> the the television I, itself. I, I I don't see that you need to do anything special here. I mean I I know that the Oppo's got this video scaler that's a feature that nobody else has and that you you feel like you right. want to take advantage of it. And I mean, there are TVs out there with really crummy upscaling. Sure. They do exist, in which case sure. it might be very nice to have a video processor somewhere in your signal chain. But yeah, I'm in agreement with Tom in this case. I mean, given that 
all of your sources are capable of output. Well, maybe his Xbox is an original Xbox and not an S or an X. Uh, but still, even if it's an original Xbox One, it can output 1080p, right. which the B7 OLED all on its own will upscale really, really nicely. Yeah, I don't so, really think you need to do anything. Yeah, without without even adding any latency. The B7 doesn't even add any latency when it's upscaling. So for gaming, it's even if it's 1080p from your Xbox One, it's great. So in this instance, there's really no need to use the Oppo 203's upscaling for any of your other sources. Now, that put to the side, let's say this is a different television or different sources, and you or or you just want to use the Oppo. You could just for the sake of argument, you could right. insert the... So you plug all of your other sources into the receiver. You send the receiver's single HDMI output to the input of the OPPO. So all of the sources are now being fed into the OPPO and the receiver is essentially just acting as an HDMI switch. And then the OPPO's HDMI output goes to your television. Now right. the OPPO is acting as a video processor and that will work for all of your other sources. Now, you would have to use the HDMI audio only output to feed audio back to your AV receiver for when you're actually using the OPPO as your Blu-ray player. So therefore it's sending its video directly to the television and separately sending its own audio back to the AV receiver. So that's fine. Right. And then the question was about ARC. Could you use the internal apps of the TV, send it via ARC from the television's input to the OPPO's output, and then from the OPPO's HDMI audio only jack to the AV receiver. Will that work? And the answer is yes, it can. Ah, there, I did not know. It is not going to be automatic though. You will have to press the input button on the OPPO's remote, which lets you cycle through three options, which are, is the, the input is itself, the Blu-ray player, or the input is the HDMI input on the back of the OPPO, or the input is HDMI ARC. There are the three options. You do have to manually select which one you're using, uh, but, it, it, but it, it'll function. It can do exactly what you want to do if that's what you want to do. So if you were to make a change and you wanted, still wanted to use the OPPO despite what we said it not being necessary, you could insert the OPPO after the AV receiver in the signal chain, so in between the AV receiver and the television, and you can do it. And, the, and, and he won't lose the Dolby Vision or whatever the other crap is, right? Well, no, because that's directly on the TV itself from the internal app. It's only the audio going back right. via ARC. And, oh, that's uh, true. That's and that'll true. work. Yeah. I mean the Atmos. He won't miss the Atmos. Won't. Nope. That, that, that'll that get fed fed on through through via ARC. Abhu, I guess. Abhu on Twitter. I think the it's Plex just a, a, Abu, but I think. Ab, how is it Abu? Or maybe it's Avu. This... Maybe, maybe it's Welsh. I don't know. It's A B H U E. I'm That's, saying Abhu. Okay. Until someone tell Abu. Ab, I don't think it's Abu. How could it be Abu? It's probably Abu. Now that I've said Pro it twenty probably times, Abu. right? It probably is. Anyway, Abs. The Plex app for. By the way, my eight year old, not twelve year old son, was. I found him flexing in front of the mirror because he's trying to get abs from climbing. Mm -hmm. And God help us all, he's finally got a couple of abs, and Ooh. he's now he almost never wears. Well, at home, he almost never wears almost any clothes. Oh, He's geez. always running around like underwear, <laughs> barely. Like he'll like wrap himself in a towel and walk around the house constantly. Windows wide open. He doesn't care. It's got, kid's got no shame. But now that he's got abs, he's going to be unbearable. <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> this is something that happens to you when you're a father of three. Okay, when you're a father of one, everything that kid does is amazing. By the time you get to three, you're like. I realize now that you are just a child who does stupid stuff constantly, <laughs> and then it deserves to be mocked for it. There's a big difference between that that the father of one and father of three. I, met, I was hanging out with some fathers of one this weekend, and then they were just unbearable. Uh, the Plex app for Xbox One was updated. Now it can uh, output HDR. If you're using the Xbox One S or X, according to Abs somebody he's just curious if we have any thoughts on the xbox one plex app he doesn't recall us talking about that specific platform i've never used it obviously have you used it the xbox I, one i gave it a try it needs an update um so uh, plex has drastically changed their ui uh with their last big change from version one right. point whatever it was to version two uh so yeah. big ui update and the uh the xbox plex app hasn't got that update yet i'm sure it will at some point you know that plex is on a gazillion different platforms so sure. when they roll out updates it's a it's a big deal to get to all of them uh but right now it is not outputting bitstream audio 
Okay. And this can be very confusing because if you set your Xbox One S or One X to output Atmos audio, sure enough, your AV receiver will say Atmos on the front of it, but it'll say Atmos all the time. So let's say you backed up a Blu-ray that had DTS HD master audio on it, and that's the MKV file that you're playing back using the Plex app, your AV receiver is still going to say Atmos. <laughs> And you know that's not Atmos because it was DTS HD. Um, so the Xbox is still decoding the audio internally, running it through a Dolby surround up mixer inside of itself, and then encoding it in an Atmos like package and sending that out. So it's not actually just sending out the original bitstream. It's not doing that in the Plex app yet. Now we know the hardware is capable of doing it. Uh, so it's, it's hardware is capable of doing so much that it doesn't yeah. actually do. Yeah, it's, but it's, like. it's, it's a software update that we're waiting for. Uh, on the video side, what I found very interesting is if you're doing HDR to SDR conversion, so like you said, uh, it just got updated to output HDR, so that's good. If you have HDR10 and an HDR10 television, it'll, it'll do that now. But I, I've, I've tried the HDR to SDR conversion on a number of things. So like yeah. on the internal app of my LG OLED TV, uh, when it converts HDR to SDR, it blows out the 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 highlights. Those get clipped, and and everything looks kind of too blown out. You know, like like okay. when you've overexposed a photo. Uh, on the Nvidia Shield, it raises the black level, so it keeps the highlight detail, but it raises the black level when it converts oh, HDR to SDR. That and stinks. <laughs> on the X on the Xbox One Plex app, it actually does the 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 contrast, the the HDR to SDR. It does that the best I've seen, but it leaves the color in the wide color. So things that aren't like, so if it's not a fully saturated P3 color, it's now a very not fully saturated 703 color. So oh. everything looks kind of dull in the colors, although it gets the contrast part of things, right? So not one of them actually gets all of the HDR to SDR conversion done correctly. Fun times. <sighs> well, one of these days. Thank, thank you. Thank you, home theater people for <laughs> introducing us to these new concepts uh -huh. that you can't seem to execute correctly thank you five years from now when you finally get it right we'll, we'll be on be the 8k ready for, we'll be ready for your 8k garbage, right. garbage to come out greg back when the epson 5040 ub first came out greg knows there was a huge price break on the older 5030 ub this is the projector at epson that's right over time the price of the 5030 has crept back up so if the epson releases a 50 50 UB or whatever the next model number is, can he expect a similar price drop to the uh, on the 5040? And if so, what price would we consider too good to pass up on the 5040? Where do we think this price might bottom out? He wants to upgrade uh, his Epson 1040, but he wants to maximize the value. Uh, there's very hard to predict pricing mm. uh, on any of these things because a lot of times uh, it's what they think the market will bear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Right. And not only that is also uh, predicated upon what they expect to happen as far as sales. They, you know, if they think that people are going to start flocking to their new 50 mm. 50, like I think they, th they thought the 50 40 was going to sell like hotcakes, and th so they better get rid of the 50 30s now while they can. And they found out that people were like, wow, this 50 30 is really nice, and the price point is too good to pass up. We're going to buy a bunch, we're going to buy this instead. So they're like, uh oh. <laughs> now we're not selling the 5040s that we were supposed to we're gonna sell. Well, so we better bump up the price there. It was a big change from the 5030 to 5040, but uh, yeah. and the 5040 is great, but it's it's a two year old model now. We are yeah. very much expecting a new model to replace it. Uh, that will at least include the 18 gigabits per second bandwidth, so that you can do 4K at 60 frames per second. Because the 5040 can't do that right now. So I'm very much expecting to see that happen. And yes, I, I am expecting a price drop on the 5040 to be sure. Both because I, I think the new one will have some capabilities that people are waiting for. And because it is a two-year-old model now. So I would expect, expect the price to go down naturally. But how low? Because the, the, the one thing that I take as an indicator is this year they introduced the Home Cinema 4000 which is like a not quite as good version of the 5040 UB. Its black levels aren't quite as deep, its contrast isn't quite as high, and it doesn't get quite as bright. Uh, so that has an MSRP of $2,000. I've seen it that one on sales get down to $1,700. So I would I would kind of expect to see the 5040 UB get down to $2,000. I think that's I think that's very possible. I think maybe it'll bottom out at maybe around $1,900, something like that. All right. That's my guess. Uh, so, uh, so the only other wrench I would throw at it, you say you want to maximize value. 
right now, the JVC X590, uh, you can find for $3,000. MSRP is $4,000. You can find that for $3,000. I completely think we'll see that at $2,500. Hmm. 2500 is where the 5040 UB is right now. So prior to any discounts, 5040 UB is 2500 So a X590 from JVC at 2500 bucks might that tempt you? <laughs> that's that's the other the other wrinkle in there. Sounds perhaps. like he didn't have twenty five hundred bucks to spend. It's, it on sounds this thing. like sounds like he's waiting yeah. for under. I, I think you will get to under two thousand dollars. At which point, I would probably pounce. I don't. I wouldn't expect it to go much lower than nineteen hundred. But I I tend to overestimate these things all the time. So hmm. who knows? But that's my guess. So his current AV receiver can pass four K resolution, but not HGCP two point two. He doesn't intend to upgrade, so he's thinking he'll need an HG Fury. Would that be the right way to go? Just, uh, it's a, pens right i mean if can you bypass your receiver and send the video directly to the to the projector that's kind of what you need to do yeah if your source if your source can do that and many uh ultra hd blu-ray players can then uh then that's your solution right there you know you go straight to your source yeah because there's more to it than just the copy protection because yeah. if you have an AV receiver that doesn't have HDCP 2.2, then that automatically means it's also not HDMI 2.0A, which means it can't pass through HDR. And one of the reasons you'd be getting a 5040UB is to be right. able to play 4K and HDR. So it's not just the copy protection, it's also the HDR. So in other words, what I'm saying is you would not want to plug in any 4K HDR sources directly into your AV receiver, like even through an HD Fury to take care of the copy protection side of it, because that'll take care of the copy protection side of it, but not the HDR side of it. Right. So any of your 4K HDR sources, you'd want to send their video uh, around the AV receiver. So this could start to get kind of complex, because if you have multiple 4K HDR sources, you'd have to put them into a switch. Now, there's inexpensive right. switches, like the, the Sewell, right? Sewell has a, a 4K right. HDR switch. So you can put it into that. Then the question is, uh, are you also using HDMI for the audio? Because if you are, that's where you would need an HD Fury AVR key not to deal with any copy protection, but to separate the video and the audio so that you can send the 4K HDR video to the projector and separately send the HDMI audio to your AV receiver. That's yeah. where you would insert the HDR key into that signal chain. Now, once you've added those two items together, it's like the price of an entry-level AV receiver that can do all say, of this on its own. <laughs> just buy a receiver. But going through all this, you might as well. Even the HG Furies, there's like a couple hundred bucks for those things. And we are yeah. already, you know, with accessories for less, you can find a Oh, like a 200, a 200 or $250. Because the, yeah. the receiver he has right now is is a not like super high-end AV receiver. Yeah. So it would be kind of a sideways I, I just, move that way, yeah. but it would have all the video stuff supported. So, yeah. I would just, I would just get a new receiver. Yeah. So he's heard that even though the Epson 5040UB says it is limited to 4K at 30, 30 frames per second, an HD Fury can get 4K 60 for gaming working on it. Is that true? Kind of. I was going to say, it's a lot of times people say, I've said it to this and it works. And what's really happening is that the projector is like, hey, you know what? You, I, I could, I, I, I'm not going to, I can only do what I could do. Yeah. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, you did you did send it to me in such a way that I can still do what I do but uh, you can't like you cannot have a projector that can only do 30 frames per second somehow trick it into doing more than that uh usually I mean it's yeah. like you can't add pixels you can't say, you're like I sent a 4k signal to my 1080p projector and it worked like yeah but you didn't get 4k out you got 1080p <laughs> Yeah, yeah the, but, it's, 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 but it worked. Okay. <laughs> the the issue here is again uh, to do this. So when you set, let's say, your Xbox One X, right, and you set it to output 4K and HDR, it'll do that at 10 bits because in order to have HDR, you need a 10 bit signal. Right. And when the Epson gets a 4K signal at 10 bits it's going to be limited to 30 frames per second or less just because that's that's the bandwidth it has available. It can't do 4K, 10 bits, 60 frames per second. doesn't have the bandwidth to do that. So it can take 4K at 60 frames per second if it's 8 bits, 
And that's where an HD Fury, like the Linker or the Integral or the Vertex, those devices can convert 4K 60 frames per second, 10-bit signal into 4K 60 frames per second, 8-bit signal. But then you lose the HDR. I was going to say, you, you know... And you lose the wide color, too, at the same right. time. So, so you get the resolution yeah, bump, can, which, by right. the way, the 5040UB actually has 1080p imagers that are being wobbled to kind of give you 4K, but it's not genuine 4K. So you're now sacrificing the wide color and the HDR to get a higher resolution that the projector can't actually natively show <laughs> to, and to get the higher frame rate. Um, that's not what I would do. I, no. Either I would just run it at 1080p at 60 frames per second because that'll work just fine. Yeah. Or I would... I mean, if this is for gaming... Yeah. I mean, if, if the gamers are like, I, I need the 60 frames per second because yeah. I, I want to... And, and that makes sense. But if you don't care about the wide color, then you probably don't really care about the 4K either, yeah. right? So go ahead and get the wide color and, you know, your, your resolution is going to be 1080p, which, by the way, you probably can't really tell that much of a difference yeah. of anyway. And, and this is where, if you went for the JVC, it can take 4K, 60 frames per second, HDR, 10-bit, all the stuff because it has the full bandwidth to do it. So, right. Yeah. David. Two weeks ago, we talked about David's new small enclosed theater room where he has one sub in his front right corner and a second sub in his rear left corner, and he was finding that he could localize his rear sub. We suggested they try manually level matching his two subs, but we couldn't recall which AV receiver is using, so he's got a Denon X4000. Yay. And he has uh, used its dual subwoofer auto setup via Odyssey Multi QXC32 with sub EQ HT. It had set his front sub to negative 6 dB and his rear sub to negative 7 dB. He adjusted things manually and wound up with his front sub at negative 4 and his rear sub at negative 9. Mm -hmm. This is a success, he says. He's no longer getting the distraction, distracting localization to his rear left. Isn't quite perfect, though. The leftmost rear seat... I'm sorry, leftmost seat of his couch still feels more of a tactile rumble from the subwoofer right next to it versus the rightmost seat, but he figures there isn't much he can do about that. That is not a question, it is a statement, and it is also true. These are physics. So air is moving, and it was shaking your But car. I wanted to comment, first of all, I'm really happy that simply manually adjusting the output levels yeah. largely solved the issue. Well, Not, it sounds not like 100%, it but pretty, yeah. pretty good. Yeah. On the video side, his TV is an LG EG9100, whatever, L OLED from 2015, and he is disappointed with its near-black performance. There's lots of blockiness and obvious banding in the shadows, no smooth gradient from gray, uh, black to gray. He tried using CNET's picture settings, uh, but they didn't help with these shadow detail problems. Is it the fault of his source? It happens with streaming services and regular TV, or is it just a limitation of the TV itself? Okay, so for those who don't really know what we're talking about here, uh, my parents used to have an Hitachi TV mm -hmm. that had the worst, most god-awful black levels I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> like, a, a black scene would come on, and it would literally be patches. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like uh, uh, some of them as big as, you know, a tenth or uh, an eighth of the screen. It would be this big square block. Yep of blackness and then right next to it with a hard edge on it there'd be another block <laughs> that was slightly less black and then you know off to the side you know it, it just it was just the worst yeah, it's supposed to look like a a smooth gradual change from black into gray but instead it's like block 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 yeah right and, and this can happen with uh a lot of there could be a lot of reasons for this sort of stuff to happen if you've got your brightness set up wrong your contrast set settings wrong you could force this in some ways right uh on some tvs uh some sources could could theoretically introduce this though i would be surprised especially with a digital source since it's just sending out ones and zeros anyways yeah but quite, but, quite often the uh like highly compressed video will yeah. have blockiness in uh, in the shadows, that's, yeah. If that's you're quite streaming common. or something like that, yeah, I mean, like my right. Netflix. Whenever whenever there's that that uh, which one is it? Is it the it's the Paramount one where it's like a flash of light and then the stars come in and they go around the little mountain oh, yeah. thing. Oh, that no, that'd is, be Paramount if it's the stars coming in. Yeah, something like that. Anyways, that one uh, always looks blocky on Netflix. Mm. I mean, it, it doesn't not blocky, but it doesn't have smooth gradients. Right, you're getting smooth. banding. Yeah, you got a lot of posterization. Banding they call it so. 
if you look at the reviews of this of your particular TV, one of the downsides is that they the one of the the negatives on most of them is says something about not having great detail in the dark in the black. In the just above black area. Yeah. So that there's I, unevenness I I, and yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think this is a problem of your source. Uh, I, I mean, sometimes, like I said, streaming services, you're just going to have to put up with garbage like that. Yeah. But uh, it does sound like your TV is the issue here. Yeah, um, yeah. There are going to be some sources that will be worse at this, but this was one of the complaints yeah. of the little bit earlier OLEDs is that the just above black, so the the complete black, they're like, that's perfect. It is it's completely, truly black, even blacker than a plasma ever was. Right. But in the just above black area, they had a lot of noise. They had unevenness. They had posterization, the, the banding. That was a complaint. Each year, it's gotten a little bit better. It's still not perfect, uh, mm -hmm. but most LCDs aren't perfect either. In the yeah. in the very near black areas, I straight up guarantee you, when they were demoing this TV, they would show you a black screen. Yes, next to a LCD black screen. Sure, yeah. And you well, would there, see yeah. how the difference, and then they would turn on the they they turn on a nice, you know, vibrant picture and put them side by side with an LCD that wasn't you know 4K and you know whatever the you know, white color gamut. Yeah, and you would see that, and they would never ever show anything that was gray. Yeah, that's right. you know? yeah, very, very dark gray. Yeah. I mean, one thing you can do to slightly improve the look of this is to, uh, so under the gamma settings, um, the higher the numerical number, the, the slower the rise out of black will be. So, like, if you set it to 2.4 instead of 2.2, things will stay blacker longer. Right. And it slight, what it does is on this TV, uh, the EG9100, it actually kind of crushes a bare to shadow detail. So mm -hmm. things that should be very dark gray just get turned into pitch black and you lose some detail altogether, but you don't see quite as much of the banding because of that. So that's a trade-off. Plus it just makes the entire image look more contrasty and dark overall. So right. maybe you really don't want that. Uh, but there's not a whole lot you can do about it, I'm afraid. And mm -hmm. even if you upgrade it to the very most modern OLED, uh, don't expect it to be 100% perfect. This is kind of a limitation of the technology. The, the, the vi just above black areas are not perfect. Jack. Jack picked up the Audio-Technica LP60 record player thanks to our recommendation. It's a gift for his significant other, so he hasn't heard it in action yet, but he started picking up some used albums. So with these recordings being used, what's a good, easy way to clean them before playing them? Well, I can tell you a good... Uh, easy but not cheap way to do it okay. uh, when i was at a uh, high-end store they wanted to play me some lps even though i had zero interest in li uh, listening to lps but they wanted to play them so they had this uh, essentially washer machine for records and you would put it in there it was just like a normal record player but it was kind of suspended a little bit and they had a top on it and you would close it and you'd press the button and it would you could hear it going to swishing water around mm -hmm. in there so there is no reason and then it would spin and there would be some air compressed air or something like that that was on there or whatever but uh yeah there is no reason why you can't just use water to do this i would suggest if it were me this is what i would do i would get a uh i would use water normal water maybe with a tiny bit of soap in it uh, i would be particularly worried about the label coming off yeah that's going to be an issue that i think you're going to have to concern but if you with. only pour from the middle towards the yeah. edge then you should be able to avoid hitting the label with the water uh i don't know that you have to use any kind of special water i don't think that i would worry about that but maybe you would uh, if you've got a microfiber a cloth you could perhaps use that but i think a paint brush of extremely soft yeah brush very wide that you could use and or the, go out with the grooves, not against the grooves. The, the actual brushes with. that they have for cleaning records. That, that, they, that I is did also not know that such a thing exists. Oh, of course it does. <laughs> I'm sure it does. But I'm just telling you that I'd go cheap. But that's what I would do. A little water, a little soap, a little paintbrush, let it dry. Yeah. Uh, Steve Guttenberg over at CNET, uh, he talked about this very thing, wrote an article about it. He decided to use distilled water. Just, just in case, whatever. Don't know why. Uh, go on. But yeah, I mean, he basically just poured distilled water over the record. He just like used he he thoroughly cleaned his hands and just very gently kind of brushed with the grooves, not not 
counter to the grooves. I would not use my hands. My hands are not the softest. That's right. <laughs> but just to, I don't understand why you why would you would use your hands. But uh, but lower down he he described the exact things that he's like un, unscented uh, you know like dish soap right very very mild just a couple of drops in the water and then the exact very soft wide paintbrush. So he he described the exact same thing. Okay, that's what I would do. Yep. Uh, yeah. Antoine on Twitter. Antoine cannot partition his basement, but there is a door at the top of the stairs, at least. So he's dealing with 8,200 cubic feet mm -hmm. of air in his basement. Should he even be thinking about pressurization? His current outlaw LFM1 can't, uh, LFM1 plus can't do it. But he has the space for much larger boxes. And they would be much yeah, they'd Much be really big, boxes. dude. <laughs> <laughs> or there'd be a lot of them stacked on top of each other. Um, I mean, what else is going on down here? Uh. And what else is going on upstairs? And, and, and what flanking paths might you have? Because yeah. I'm thinking there's probably... Are, how a worried are you about uh, rattling things off of flat surfaces upstairs? Because you're, you're going to be testing the structural integrity of your house. <laughs> now, can you do this? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Oh, absolutely. We could, you could get enough subwoofer to do this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, clearly, there's movie theaters that are much bigger than this, oh, and yeah. they, they, they pressurize just fine. So, uh, what else is going to be happening when you're watching movies? Uh, how, how much freedom do you have down here? And uh, how worried you about uh, the sound traveling to other parts of the house? Because this will be daddy's watching a movie, I can tell, because <laughs> the trees outside are shaking. <laughs> <You know? laughs> a branch fell out of the tree again, killed the dog. Oh, well. At least dad got to see the Transformers again. <laughs> so uh, it, it could do it. You could do it. You could do, do it. Yeah, you go in JTR Captivator, yeah. uh, maybe one of the really big rhythmics or the, the bigger end of the power sound audio range. Yeah. They, they, can, they can deal with this type of cubic footage. It can definitely be done. It is a big, big box. Um, right. But yeah, it, it can be done. It should, should he be thinking about it? Well, it, I'll say, put it this way. It is not entirely out of the question. But I would say it is questionable to the part, all the things we mentioned. You've got to look at all the other right. things that could potentially be a, a problem in here. Uh, and then that will help you decide. The rattles, dude. Just think of the rattles. The rattles, but also, you know, I mean, <laughs> everywhere you have an electrical outlet, uh, uh, heating, uh, ventilation duct, um, anything that could potentially be an opening. It, this, you're talking about I really want him to do it I can be honest with yeah. you <laughs> I do I really want him to do it just so, this, so we can see what it looks like when he has it set up and I would like you to take a video and we won't we won't post it to YouTube or anything like that just take a video of your subs like while you know movies going on and then you walk up the stairs and close the door <laughs> and then I want to I just want to see if there's things rattling around in your kitchen <laughs> you know stuff like that it's just ugh but th th uh, this is, th think of it like water. You're talking yep. about completely filling 8,200 cubic feet with water. That's a lot of water. That's a lot of pressure. It's it's not much different with air. You're talking about the same thing, pressurizing the entire space. Yeah. Everett. Everett says, we've talked about manually adjusting speaker and subwoofer trim levels. Where does he find those on his Denon x 4400 H, there's a subwoofer level adjust in the audio section of the settings, but nothing in there for all the other speakers. Where should he go within this maze of settings? <laughs> so it's usually under, uh, once you hit setup or yes. settings, yeah, whatever it's, it is. It's setup in the case of the Denon. On the, on, the, on the remote, it'll say setup. And then you, you would go to audio. Nope. And then it's going to be channel levels, usually, unless it's something different. Nope, on this that's one, not what it's called. <laughs> would they change it again? Yeah, because uh, so that there's audio at the top. Yep. There's video right below that. Yep. And then below that, video. there's speakers. Oh, geez, they changed it. Okay, I haven't, I haven't been in here in a while. It's in the, it's in the speakers menu. Yeah. So set up, and they go to speakers, and then you have to go to manual, uh, manual settings. Yeah, manual settings underneath speakers. Okay. And is that as far as you have to go? Yeah, within there, you will Should find be right one there, right? And then that says levels. As, as, yeah, as you hit the different speakers, it's going to send a test tone through them, and then you're going to adjust the trim level right well, there. Well, even so, so okay, so speakers, manual setup. Yeah. Under manual yeah. setup, you will see things for amp assign, speaker config, distances, and levels. So you go down to levels, and okay. then you actually have to hit the button that says test tone start, and oh. then go through each of the speaker's positions. Let's see. Yeah, it's a lot of steps. I don't blame you for 
kind of getting lost in he this. Used to be under audio. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> that's where he looked because that kind of seems like the intuitive name for. I want to make a change to my audio settings. Oh, settings. Oh, audio settings. Where is it? No, it's, yeah. un it's under speakers. So, uh, put it this way, dude. I would have gone. I would have gone to audio and gone. Uh, back well, especially out, since back there out. is speakers. a subwoofer level adjust in there. In there, yeah, yeah. there is, yeah. <laughs> Which, by the Richard. way, don't don't touch that. Don't touch yeah. the subwoofer level adjust in the audio section. That's only going to mess up everything that happens over in the speaker settings. Yeah, yeah. But there it is. All right, Richard. Richard asks uh, in regards to goosing the bass. We've said that one solution is to use the Odyssey Editor app to manually adjust the target curve and to have more bass. But his receiver model is a bit older, so he can't use the app. Then we said it's probably best to use the receiver's trim level settings to increase the output signal going to the subwoofers and then leave the volume knobs on the subs uh, themselves alone. But then we also said that if you end up boosting the trim levels to more than 6 dB or so, that you might start running out of headroom or something, so don't boost the trim levels too much. So could he... For, by the way, we never said plus 6. I, I mentioned that, so I think... Yeah, I, 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 I just... Once you get close to that plus The 10, plus side of things, yeah. Yeah. So could he, he asks, turn up the volume dials on the subs themselves, then run Odyssey and expect it to set the subwoofer trim levels to a negative number, then turn up the trim levels on in the receiver to get the bass boost that he wants? Or should he just run Odyssey as normal and simply turn up the volume dials on the subs themselves after it's done until the bass is at the output level that he wants? You're better off doing the first thing that you said. Mm. I think, you know, that way you have a little bit more finite, fine control. Most subs, their volume knobs are, you know, infinitely variable which yeah. means that if you sneeze while you're doing it who knows where you'll end up you know and that, that's just a recipe at least you could set everything back to where it was yeah you know if you use the trim levels so if, if you've got a newer receiver they're not gonna it's not gonna be real happy if you try to tr set the the levels up a little bit higher you know but you can maybe force it it depends on which receiver you're using but uh odyssey i know if you're too much over 75 db it gets mad at you yeah it goes it goes red <laughs> it goes Turn red it down, you can't do anything but you know what right. you can do is after you've gone through that step then you turn up the knobs on the <laughs> volume dials. It doesn't yeah, know. Yeah, you got to be real careful. Yeah, yeah. just got to be real yeah, careful. Don't, don't it, go, if, yeah, if might... afterwards it's like a negative 12, right. well, then you know you went way too high. You went too far, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you might have to do it a couple of times. Might be a little bit of trial and error. But yeah, uh, yeah, uh, I agree. Probably better turn up the knobs a little bit before you run Odyssey. Go ahead and run Odyssey. It should set them to a negative number at that point. And then if you want to boost it, boost the trim level. Because yeah, yeah. now you have the headroom. <sighs> back is killing me oh. alex it's just a chair <laughs> first some before and after alex had the pull down screen with upside down tower so the tweeters wouldn't be blocked when the screen was pulled down i remember this mm -hmm. it was a very bizarre setup uh, i guess you're seeing some pictures on youtube if you're not there's a pull down screen and then there is some upside down towers behind and there's it. a little a little center hiding off center underneath the bottom edge of the screen there because right. that's Something where it fit like that and then he's got this projector that's hanging underneath a shelf yep <laughs> this is all very strange uh and but the the room itself is real nice and uh, you know it's a nice little setup here he's got a, a tv behind his, his yeah he had a, had a wall mounted tv behind the the drop down projector screen that that's the before though then that was the and before. we talked about a bunch of stuff and he took all of our advice, so he wanted to share the results. He got five CAF Q100 bookshelf speakers, all wall-mounted. He used his spare Sony bookshelf speakers that he had on, a, on hand and mounted them to the ceiling as top middles. He went with the refurbished Denon X3300W receiver. He scored a pair of SVS PB12 NSD subs back when they were being sold off for $500 a piece. He mounted a fixed-frame silver ticket screen, and he got some DIY acoustic panels from Acoustamac that he mounted on his back wall and left side wall since his right side is open and now when we look at this we see uh, a much cleaner and non upside down speaker setup <laughs> <laughs> which is quite a bit nicer and he's got speakers they're quite they're, i mean they're large uh, for sure. ceiling mounted but they look fine up there they're just fa facing straight down uh it looks like he got those set up just fine he's got some surround back speakers uh and he's got some is that right is that no he's got backs? surrounds yeah he, this is a 5 5.2 this other 5. This this other fisheye picture or panoramic. Oh, it is a panorama, right yeah. So it, it's, it's distorted. The geometry is distorted in the panorama. Yes. Yeah, because it's bent, whatever. Okay, so he's got he's got five point two point two two point two. Yeah, because it was X thirty three hundred uh, that he went with for the receiver. 
So he's very happy with the results, and he thinks it looks and sounds amazing. I think it looks awesome, too. It does. I mean, he's got like one, two, three, four panels, three on the back wall, Mm -hmm. one on the left wall to catch that first reflection from the speaker. Uh, he looks. He thinks it looks and sounds amazing, but therein lies the problem. Now that he's heard his downstairs theater room, his upstairs living room sounds awful to him. It's an open <laughs> concept space, so he and his wife often end up using this living room setup to listen to music or have sports playing while on TV while they're in the kitchen. Uh, he currently has one of the 5.1 Vizio soundbars that includes the wireless sub with surround speakers, but he can't stand the way it sounds anymore. Right. <laughs> well, there you go. We're just ruining lives left and right upgraded his main theater he's like oh wait what i had before i, I don't like it anymore yeah. <laughs> we've so been his placement there. options are very limited uh what whatever replaces the visio sound bar needs to go on top of the fireplace mantle just like the current setup and that space is only 5.75 inches tall they're not going to redo the tv mount for this six and a half uh, about six and a half inches deep or 6.6 inches deep and 64 inches wide the absolute maximum budget would be a grand but the less he spends the happier the wife will be he's really good if there's a really good sound bar he's open to it but he's also open to something where he could start with 3.1 up front and figure out the way to add uh, wireless surrounds later if he gets a full av receiver like the denon x 1300w and not too expensive but not too crappy subwoofer like the bic pl 200 that already eats up a lot of his budget i wouldn't do that at all be honest with you and finding speakers that can fit into the available space is challenging he found some mica brand speakers that would fit or the rsl speakers although uh, those would put them over budget so what do we suggest you're not gonna like any of my suggestions okay (laughs) i'm gonna tell you that right (laughs) now but here they come anyway (laughs) but here they come you asked so here it comes uh i think that you should do one of two things one is live with the awfulness of this surround bar and just let it Remind you how important it is that your home theater is this much better. I that's 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 I think that is probably what I would do. I would sit here and scowl at this thing every time it was on, and I would be mad at it. And I would say I'm not watching anything in here ever again. I, and then do that. I cannot agree with that. <laughs> okay, that's 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 probably what I would do. Okay, now. I know you have very limited space and everything else, and you're talking about receivers and all these other things. But if you're listening to music, you had what did he do with his tower speakers? Do we know what he did with those? Oh, sell those? The big towers from downstairs from before. I don't know. It seems to me like if you took those towers and you set them up someplace here, even if they weren't perfectly centered on the TV, which I don't think is important in this case because we're not doing critical listening, we're not caring about any of that stuff. What we are doing is just trying to get some sound up here that doesn't suck. I would take and maybe, if you're amenable to this, I would use those and I would place them wherever I could and then I would get the world's cheapest surround or use the sound bar as it is, but only feed it the surround channel. And uh, then you're only out the, the, the price of a uh, the, the budget receiver to do the 2.0 setup. I would not get a BIC sub you're gonna hate yeah. it. You're gonna hate it, and you're gonna you would hate it if it was in your theater. You're definitely gonna hate it in this big <laughs> open concept space where all it's gonna do is fart around and not really and literally make farting noises almost certainly. You know, as it tries to fill up this space with bass. That's actually what one of the one of the funny uh, subwoofers that it it has no filter on the bottom end, so yeah. it'll try to play ten hertz. It'll it'll try. It it won't, yeah. but it'll try. <laughs> So if it were me, I would try to use the tower. I would either do nothing or I would try to use the tower speakers and then uh, just so that we you got a, you got big sound up here. And because uh, it sounds like you're sitting kind of far away for the most part and not really critical listening yeah. or critical watching. So it doesn't really matter where you put the speakers anyways. So that's what I would do. Okay. My suggestion is something I would like you to try. And I want you to make sure that if you do try this, you buy it from a place where it's going to be easy to return it. Best Buy would be a perfectly fine option. They're really quite easy with returns. If Costco sells these, give it a try from there because they'll take it back. Uh, But I want you to try one of the new Sony soundbars. All all of the early reviews are very positive, noting all of them have gone, all of the reviews have gone out of their way to say, these things play way louder than I thought they would, given the size. Mm. Um, So this could be worth a try. Uh, So they have their, is it $600 or $700 for the uh, the HTX 9000F? 
Um, so that one spend six hundred dollars on a sound bar. It's just not happening. Sound bar and sub. <laughs> well, he said if there's a really good sound bar for under a thousand dollars, you might consider it. And that's why I'm saying give it a try, but make sure you can return the thing because I'm not I'm not putting my one hundred percent stamp of approval on this, but I think it's worth a shot. He was saying he might like to start with 3.1 up front and possibly add wireless surrounds later. You can do that with the Sony HTZ9F soundbar. That is a 3.1 soundbar, and then there are optional wireless surround speakers that you can add to it later. You can't do that with the X9000F soundbar. You can do it with the HTZ9F soundbar, but it's $900 out the gate to get the 3.1 and the subwoofer up front. Right. And then the, the wireless surrounds are, are like $300 or something completely overpriced to add them but that's that's possibly in the future three hundred dollars <laughs> i know it's way overpriced for two wireless surround speakers i don't know what's going on there but that's that's what they're charging uh but yeah the x9000f i like the looks of it furthermore what i really like about these sony soundbars is that they pass through all the hdr stuff they have full 18 gigabits per second pass through and they actually handle atmos and dts x now you're saying okay that's stupid with a 2.0 sound 2.1 soundbar and i basically agree with that however this is a matter of if you're ever sharing sharing signals with something else. This is a way to keep everything compatible without having to worry about anything being down mixed to two channels or something less. I think there's real value in suffering through a terrible <laughs> system so that you, when you go to your home theater, you remember how good it is. It's like me going to my brother-in-law's, and if he ever listens to this podcast, I'm in so much trouble, mm. to, to watch a football game. It is so bad. It is so incredibly bad like the, the settings of the tvs are it's all everything's blown out and terrible uh the, the he's using the tv speakers or maybe it's hooked to some sort of bluetooth speaker i can't really tell but no one can hear anything that's going on so the subtitles have to be on it is just so terrible and i go home i'm like oh that's right that's why i have all this stuff because <laughs> it's so much better in here so yeah uh, but let us know what you do. I'm yeah. very curious. I'm very curious. I do think that the, the the cheap solution is just to buy a cheap receiver and then use your your existing your speakers, towers, yeah. your existing towers. Um, even if you don't have the existing towers anymore, any of the speakers that you had before probably perform quite a bit better. I mean, you, you could you go full cal birds if you just want to get a, a couple of birds and a and a receiver. That could work. That would be fine too. Yeah. That would be fine too. And they're small and they're, you could put them on stands and you could put them, or not stands, but on shelves someplace or yeah. something like that. They're fully sealed. So that would be good too. Andrew on Facebook. Andrew spent the last year buying, selling, or trading on Craigslist until he ended up with the speakers he wanted. So now he has a 5.2 configuration with Paradigm Monitor Series speakers, towers, and centers up front with ADP dipole surrounds and two subs one 10 inch one 12 inch it's all being powered by a dead end s720 w receiver which is ample power thanks to the monitor series being very efficient adp is a different company or ADP no adp is, is a, the, the 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 name, name that the paradigm from, gives to their dipole okay, surrounds okay. yeah got it Okay. He doesn't have any urge to upgrade uh, at all to upgrade his gear, but he'd like some help to tweak and optimize the room and set up so that he's getting the most out of what he bought. All right. So we're not buying new stuff. Stop trying to make people buy stuff, Rob. No HG Furies for this guy. He's in a basement room that is 13 by 21 by 8. Welcome to my world. That's about what my room is. There's a hallway opening to, on the left that goes to a bedroom and bathroom, but is otherwise sealed. That's fine. His TV is on one of the 13-foot uh, 13 walls, which is opposite of me. Is that right? No, that's right. The same one. And his seats are about nine, uh, eight, eight to nine feet away from the TV. His towers flank the TV about one foot away from each side, slightly towed in. His center is 14 inches off the ground and tilted up to aim at his head. His surrounds are directly to either side and one and a half feet down from the ceiling. And he has a 12-inch sub just to the left of the TV and the 10-inch sub shifted to the right behind his sofa. Is there anything about the placement of his gear that we would recommend changing? Lowering the subs... And pushing the back subwoofer back. Probably. Lowering the subs. Lowering the surrounds, you mean? Surrounds. Surrounds, okay. yes. And lowering the surrounds because they're only a foot and a half off the ceiling. It's probably, it could be lower. And then the back subwoofer sounds like it's too far into the room. If you could put that closer so that it is more like where the front subwoofer is. but So on like the on the back wall. Well, it doesn't say necessarily that his are on the front wall, but it does sound well. Like so yeah, I mean, the twelve inch just yeah. to the left of the TV, and the TV's on the front wall, so right. Yeah, we think, but I'm just saying, so that it's mirrored, but in the back. Yeah, 
that's the two things that jumped out. Although I think he did mention like. in the email he's, he's getting some nice tactile sensation from having the sub like right behind his sofa. So if he doesn't want to give up that, um, yeah. I would give that up in a heartbeat to get more <laughs> even base. Across more uniform board. base across your seats? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's about it. I mean, I don't know how large the TV is. So having them only one foot to either side, they might be kind of close together. If it's a small TV, they might be perfectly far apart if it's a big tv so i'm not quite sure well i mean my my and my how far off the wall did they say they were about a foot and a half or foot what the speakers the speakers didn't yeah. say off the wall just that they're about a foot away from each side of the tv oh yeah that's true too. yeah okay because mine are about a f two feet maybe a foot and a half to two feet into the to room from the side walls right because i've got a 92 inch screen behind me yeah, so yeah, <laughs> yeah that's uh that 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 necess necessitates that, but you might want to cheat those out a little bit further if they are. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, you know, Dolby together. would have you at the at twenty two degree angles. Yeah. So you, you look straight ahead. That zero degrees, twenty two degrees to your left, twenty two degrees to your right. You can use the Compass app on your phone to approximate it. It actually works just fine. Um, I have not used that. So they might be a little bit wider apart. Uh, center sounds fine. You could. I I don't think it's necessary to lower the surrounds. He doesn't have Atmos, so having them up higher, I'm fine with. To be honest. It's okay. And, I'm saying, uh, those are the he asked. Yeah. What would I yeah. what would I change? Those and, are the things I would change. Yep. Yeah. Possibly put the sub on the, the the rear sub on the very on the actual back wall. Yeah. Yeah. see auto setup said this towers to large and set forty hertz, sixty hertz, and ninety hertz crossovers for his main centers and surrounds. Uh, he manually set all of his speakers to small, increase the crossover frequency to eighty hertz while leaving the surrounds at ninety hertz. Is this is this is good this is what you should do and i would say yes yep this is i i think this that's, i mean if you notice that there's like a gap or something in between any of those speakers and where your subs kick in you could raise it a little bit higher but other than that i say you've done good that sounds okay to me since his den s 720w doesn't have sub eq ht he ran odyssey only with his front sub then added his rear sub manually by ear Auto setup set the subwoofer for trim levels to minus 12 dB. He manually boosted that up to minus 9 dB for a little extra oomph. Is that the best way to set up and then goose his subs a bit? Nope. No. <laughs> no. There is a whole lot not good about that. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to plug your subs in individually to your, uh, to your uh, receiver and then have them set the levels. Have the receiver set the level. Uh, and you're going to change the volume knob so that it reads minus 3 dB on the trim For levels. each of them. Yeah, so you, you run it them. on sub number one by itself first. You yep. might have to run it a couple of times. Yep. And you adjust the knob on the back of sub number, subwoofer number one until you get a reading of negative 3 dB set by Odyssey. And then you and repeat you that with only sub the same thing two. with the other sub. Now both these subs are at the same volume relative to your yeah. main list. They are position. level matched. Then you will plug them both in at the same time yes. and then run Odyssey. Yes. And then the, plugging them both in will give you a 3 dB boost, which means you're now at zero trim level, or at least you should. Odyssey will then hopefully send it to zero. And then at that point, you're off to the races. Yes, yeah, because what you've done you, by what was described is you've only EQ'd one of the two subwoofers. Yes. You haven't EQ'd... The other one, who knows what that one's doing. Yeah, and well, the it's fact the that combination it your, is... Yeah. Well, and, and, and setting the... The fact that it sent him to negative 12 dB means that it, it was, was way too loud. Too loud to begin, to begin with. with, yeah. So negative 12 is as low as it can set it. It set, set it. It's as absolute bottom. So what that means is that it... 75 dB was someplace either at negative 12 or all the way to considerably lower. Yeah. Now, I would venture to say that once we get this thing set up a little bit better, you may be sitting in a null and that's why you're messing around with the base so much. Mm. Once you get your subwoofers properly placed and do the correct setup, live with it a little while. I would just wish people would live with it a little while before you decide whether or not you're going to boost your base. Don't listen to five seconds of you know, you five seven <laughs> one, and say, nah, it's got. Especially if it's, it's like, oh, this doesn't. Spleen. This doesn't sound as loud as it used to, so I want to boost. It's like, oh, but it might not have been accurate before, and now you're yeah. actually hearing accuracy for the first time. Yeah. yeah, you need to live with it for a little bit so that you know for sure. Because a lot of times, what happens when you get dual subs for the first time, you're like, where'd all my bass go? I, where'd all my bass go, Hoss? I used to be used to be shaking this couch all the time, and all of a sudden. So, there is bass in the actual track that's supposed to be loud and 
and, and shaking your couch and it does and it does in such a way that it takes you, almost takes you by surprise you're like wow that's amazing i wish it would do that all the time well guess what it's not supposed to do it all the time it's only supposed to do it when it's supposed to do it <laughs> and you were having it do it all the time before or it was doing it all the time before because of unevenness of base at your seated location so, so uh, level match first yeah. Then have them both plugged in, run Odyssey fully. And then if, if after you've gotten used to it, you can still boost it via the trim level, but they, they should be run together when you're actually doing Odyssey for the proper time so that it can EQ them as a mono signal. All right. He has Odyssey set to reference with dynamic volume turned off. He decided to slightly boost the trim levels of his surround speakers. This dude likes to mess with those speakers. Are there any other settings he should tweak in order to get the best sound? You should stop tweaking. Well, <laughs> and also, stop. he didn't mention whether he used dynamic EQ or not. Right. Because one of the things dynamic EQ will do is when your master volume is below zero dB, it'll boost the subwoofer and the surrounds to keep them right. audible, which sounds like the very thing you're after. So if dynamic EQ is also turned off at this point, turn it on it might actually deliver the results that you want without you having to manually change any of the trim levels and then again leave it alone for a bit leave it alone get used to it so he doesn't have the acoustic panels yet when he was running odyssey he could hear a fairly obvious reflection that was strongest coming from his right surround speaker so should he put panels up behind each speaker where should the acoustic panels go and can he temporarily hang a comforter on the wall to test if the acoustic panel will make a worthwhile difference okay that last thing yes yes you, you should do that totally but uh just putting just assuming that speakers uh that panels have to go behind speakers is not necessarily accurate mm -hmm. we often say put them behind your mains sure that's that's pretty common, mainly because common, it's but, actually just that they're on the front wall and we're stopping yeah. the front to back reflection uh but most of the time it's more it's very important that you put them behind you you want yes. them on your back wall so yeah, that any you. reflection off of the back wall coming back at you is caught and uh minimized and then you want your first reflection points of your speakers where is the first reflection point you sit in the main seat you have your wife ha take a mirror or your friend or your kid or I don't know, tape it to a dog or something. Have them walk down the wall. The side the wall. Mirror on the side wall. Uh, with the mirror on the wall, when you can see the speaker in the mirror, that is your first reflection point. That is where your panel should go, and you make sure that it is uh, it is in line with and above and below your tweeter. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, the places to start, if you have a limited number of, of panels to deploy... The wall behind you, the listener, and the side walls at the first reflection points. Those are the places to start. And then behind the main speakers. Behind the main speakers on the front wall. Straddling corners, if you can do that yeah. as well, for uh, base absorption. But that's uh, that's a lot. Uh, okay. F. If he does decide to add absorption panels, would it be better to make some DIY panels using Roxel or some similar type of insulation? Or are their acoustic foam panels from Amazon just as good? Foam panels suck. And they aren't as good. <laughs> they not should not even be even close. But uh, yes, the DIY or the non-DIY, if you want to purchase them, sure. are all very uh, basically the same thing. Yeah, like the the kits that you the can same material. the kits that you can buy from Acoustimac. That's a great way to save some money. You assemble yeah. it yourself, but they've done all the work of putting together all the materials you need. Uh, yeah. And then flat packing the frame, so you just kind of assemble it. That's a great way to, to go. Uh, very easy, because then you don't even have to cut anything or whatever. Uh, but yeah, no, you want ones that are done with proper insulation. The, the, the foam is next to useless. All right. He eliminated every rattle that he could by using a rubber tape and that sticky blue tack stuff. Yeah. His floor is a hard surface, but he put down a thick rug between his seats and his front speakers. That's another first reflection mm -hmm. point, by the way. And uh, his wife is fully on board with any changes that will improve their home theater experience. So any other changes or additions we would suggest? Yeah, uh, base strapping, for sure. Sure. If you if you can get some corner traps, the Gick, uh, what are they? Tri traps. Tri traps. Tri -traps yeah. uh, those are good. Or whatever solution you have. Yeah, Acoustimac normal... has uh, has panels with like uh, beveled edges, so they yeah. fit perfectly yeah. into a corner as well. Those would be that would be the probably the number one thing I would suggest okay. if you're looking at that is base trapping because you haven't suggested anything along those lines, um, but absorption is definitely going to be part of it. If I mean if you're looking for a home theater experience, then getting true ish home theater seats is mm, pretty nice, sure. dude. It makes a quite a bit of difference when now 
I'll be honest with you. I've never had really good experiences with drink holders <laughs> at, at in in couches because they 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 look real nice. They seem like a really good idea, but they're either too big, they're too small, or more likely when your glass sweats, yeah, it gets a bunch of water in there and then it rots out whatever's underneath it. And I've never had a very good luck with drink holders. The ones from HD but, Market are smart because they actually have a removable little cup thing in the cup holder so you can yeah. take that out and wash that smart yeah uh but i really do like the 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 motorized oh yeah motorized legs. reclining sure it's just so nice that you could set it exactly where you want it to be that to me is a is a is a quality of life difference it's not necessarily going to increase your experience right of the the video or the audio but it is going to increase your enjoyment of sitting in that theater for a long period of time so i am uh i am of the opinion that is a good idea okay my only other suggestion is actually over on the video side if you want to try it uh one nice thing is if you can turn out all the lights but not have a completely pitch black black room so we call that uh you know having some uh, some bias lighting so that's, that's something you could try. So you could head over to uh, cinemaquestinc.com. They've got their Ideal Loom LED uh, bias lights, which are like perfectly neutral white light. You actually mount them behind your television and it shines on that front wall. And if you make that the only source of light other than your TV itself, uh, it gives you a perfect bias light. There you you go. Try that. Christian. Christian set up a Harmony activity that turns on his Denon X3300W, sets it to the input for his Chromecast, but leaves the TV off. He uses this activity in the morning when he's getting ready for work uh, to play music from his YouTube music playlist, which he queues up on his phone and then casts the Chromecast. Okay. All right. Uh, my son has a YouTube music playlist, which I find highly offensive. <laughs> <laughs> he's 14. My wife is very upset with me because I don't... Uh, you don't parental my, lock? I don't... I just don't think that it's that big of a deal and maybe i'm a bad parent because of it but i'm like if the if 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 him getting away with listening to gangster rap is is the thing that he gets away with in my house well you know relatively speaking it's not that big of a deal everybody i knew when i was his age was listening to a uh, two live crew and motley crew or and all the other crews that were out there nwa all that stuff so and, and we all most of us turned out okay so whatever <laughs> Anyways, YouTube playlist. Normally this works like a charm, but the previous week uh, he did his normal routine, but when the music started playing, it was insanely loud and his receiver shut down within a couple of seconds with a red blinking light on the front. Probably not good. Yeah, that's not what you want. He stopped his music playlist on his phone, turned the receiver back on, and lowered his volume to negative 40 dB, noting that the volume had started at plus 17.5 dB, which is apparently the maximum. Thankfully, everything seemed to function fine after that, and he has now set a maximum volume limit in the uh, X3300W settings for 0 dB. Any idea what might have happened? He never turns the volume higher than negative 5, and nobody else used the system before him this morning. Is that just a glitch, or could this potentially happen again? I mean, it could potentially happen. If it happened once, it can happen again. But guess, it sounds yeah. to me, uh, this is, without knowing exactly what your Harmony setup is mm -hmm. exactly, it, stuff like this tends to happen when your batteries are low. <laughs> you know what I mean? You get like some sort of weird s signal that goes out and screws everything up. Yeah. But for me, it's probably just, you know, ghost in the machine it's just a glitch yeah i mean the, there I, is I, I another setting within the av receiver which is um the turn on volume yes 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 um so i mean i know that it's usually so a lot the default is to is leave it at where it says last which means whatever volume you were listening to last that's where it turns back on uh but i prefer to set it to like i set mine to negative 35 so right. when it turns on, it comes on at negative 35. Yes, that means I have to hit the volume up button for anything that I'm watching, but it means that whenever it turns on, it's not going to come on too loud. It just turns on at this negative 35. This really sounds like somehow the volume up button got pressed and stuck. In or place. like maybe even the night before by accident, and it was set to last. So when it turned on, it just turned back yeah. on. That's really what it sounds it, like. That's to what me, it sounds like to me. Yeah. It. it, it, it I think Rob's solution is probably that whatever volume you like the YouTube to be, yeah. that's what I would have the automatic. Have that as the turn on volume, yeah. Yeah. 
the X3300 W has some different options for the maximum volume limit, but there's nothing between zero dB and no limit. He preferred to have the option to maybe go to plus three or plus five. Is there any way to get around this? No. <laughs> That's, I mean, you can't you can reprogram the thing, I guess. I, I suppose mean, you could no. futz with your trim levels. Yeah, that just is just silly. Boost yeah. all your trim the levels answer is a bit no. so that zero equals plus five, and then you just have yeah. to remember that, but... So why is plus 17.5 dB above reference volume even possible? What possible application could that have? Have you met kids? <laughs> have you ever met them? No, but that it's not a good thing. I understand. I mean, it's just... There's going to be somebody. I mean, I've had mine up at... For certain... Uh, sources which were yeah. generally softer than others, I have had it up uh, and, and with DV, specific discs that were yeah. softer than others. I've had it up to negative, t I mean, plus 10 before. Sure. You know, plus 7.5, plus 5 is not unknown to me. So there, there does need to be some headroom above this. And it's because you have to assume that not every source and not every piece of content you have is going to be mixed yeah, exactly to reference volume the way it should be. Yeah, it's a, so you got to have something above reference basically a po po poorly mastered content. And then, then you right. have to. Yeah, eleven minutes. Justin, not Beaver on Facebook. Justin and his family have moved into their new house. Yay! The loft will remain a loft. Yay! Yay! They decided to set up one of the bedrooms as a dedicated theater. Yay! <laughs> we win. <laughs> High five, Rob. High yes, five. yes. Hi. The, 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 wait, wait, which way is the five? This way? Oh, uh, the, yeah, uh, this way. One, two, three, da, da. Oh, that, that didn't work at all. Oh, whatever. Terrible. We, we, that, that was internet fives. Awful. Not the best fives. Just terrible five. All right. Uh, he's got his room. It's 12 feet, 3 inches long by 9 feet, 3 inches wide. We're going to call it 12 by three, 9. With a small window in the rear on the left. I'm sorry. A small window on the left, a closet on the rear near the back, and the entry door on the right near the front. Justin intends to remove the closet doors and put his equipment in there, and his surround speakers will go in stands and see that there doesn't seem to be anywhere else to mount them with proper positioning. Do we agree with their general layout? Let me look here. Uh, okay, Me so did. you're showing this on, on online. Uh, his couch is near the back wall. Yeah. With the, ca with the I guess the cabinet's going to be on the right yeah. of his couch. Closet to his right, yep. And then to his left, there's going to be, uh, there's a window. Uh -huh. And the on the on the left wall, on the right wall near the front, there is a door. Yes. Okay. And this, this room is how big? 12 feet by 9 feet. Oh. It's very small. Yeah, quite small. So he so he's going to be sitting... Um, probably in the vicinity of 10 feet away from his front wall. Look, glancing at this, maybe sure. a little bit more. I mean, it, it, just going by the diagram, it kind of looks like he's pretty close to that back wall. So like, yeah, be, between 10 and 11 feet, according to where the things are shown in the diagram. Yeah, I think you can sit closer than that. I, I, I'm going to I'm gonna recommend sitting closer <laughs> coming up. And if you sit closer than that, then I see the no... Uh, first of all, I see no problems with you putting surround speakers in this these locations. Anyways, above your closet should have some room. You Not know, a whole your lot, though. Door. I mean, the closet is going to be but, six feet, seven inches high. Yeah, but I mean, if it's just a surround speaker, you just, you know, prime elevations right there. Yeah. Boom. Done. I'm fine with putting them on stands, especially if you move your seat a bit closer, then you'll have a little bit more room behind you. They don't have to be directly to the other side. They can be slightly yeah. behind you, and you'll have the space to do that if the seat is a little more forward. That's that's what I'm going to say. I would put my I would put myself no further away. No, yeah, than probably what seated about eight feet oh, away. Oh, eight eight feet from, is going to be ideal. Yeah, eight feet. I wouldn't be any any further away than eight feet. Which leaves you four wall. feet behind your head, which is probably like three feet behind your actual couch. Yeah. But that's just nice. And your speakers could be on stands just a little bit behind you. Yeah. yeah. So what screen size should he go for? He'd like to get as large an image as reasonable, but his tower speakers, uh, RBH impression series, needs to have enough space to go on either side. Uh -huh. So if you're eight feet away, yes. and this room is nine feet wide, yes. you can't go with the 92-inch screen, because I can tell you right now, uh, while it will fit in your room, your speakers will not fit on either uh, side of it. Just... Just, it's, just i would not recommend it really so i would go for whatever's down from 92 well if you're going silver ticket there is nothing smaller than 92 okay then you're gonna go 92 you, and you're just gonna make it work boy you can get the 92 that has essentially no bezel they yeah. do have a very uh super thin bezel option i mean it only buys you a few more inches but in a room this small a few more inches might be just what you need however if you go with the regular one the one that has a normal edge around it it is 85 inches wide including the width of the frame mm. 
That leaves you 13 inches on either side. Your speakers are about eight inches wide which means you now have five inches to either side of your speakers. They're, they're basically remember, right in the front corners. The, the sight lines uh, on your speakers are different than you think they are, too. They, you, they could be a little bit. Because they're, the yeah. they're, the, they're in the room slightly. Yeah, and they're that forward means that on when the you're, screen. Yeah. When, you're, when you're projecting onto the screen, they can actually be in a little bit. Does that mean that somebody sitting on the absolute side of your couch, like leaning over to the side, isn't, is going to have part of the screen blocked by the speaker? Could be. But uh, don't care because I'm not that person. But if, if you go with the edgeless I'm... design, that buys you another five inches. Yeah, there you go. So, nine, 92 Just... inch silver ticket. And you sit eight he feet has... away, that gives you a 45 degree field of view. It's all perfect. There you go. He has two, two, by, two foot by four foot absorption panels and two one foot by four foot absorption panels. Uh, both, all of them are four inches thick. Sounds similar to what I've got here. He also has two more pieces of two by four uh, foot insulation that he could make into additional panels or just leave them as raw insulation and put them in the equipment closet. Where do we recommend he places his, his panels? Well, you ain't going to have any room behind your speakers. Uh, the corners. Uh, if well, back wall. Back wall for sure. And, and first what, reflection points. <laughs> I, I mean, the first reflection point. Oh, it might be the door. Be a door. On the right. Well, I'd, I'd put them. I'd put them like right beside your front speakers because your front speakers are basically going to be in the corners. Yeah. So I'd put them like right beside your front speakers. That basically leaves you no room, but that's okay. You got a four inch thick panel, then your tower speaker, then the frame of your screen, and they're all like right there. You next can to also each other. have them. You do what I did, and you have them straddling the corner. I have sure. tri traps going across the floor, and underneath my speak, uh, my my underneath the uh, the screen projection screen yeah. and then just behind the center channel which is on the stand in the middle of the room okay. you know, coming out in the middle of the room you could do that as well or above i guess if you really want to but you're gonna end up doing it below uh if you have a ceiling fan don't because it's a pain <laughs> in the butt when you're in this kind of situation you also have to worry about your sight line uh your throw distances on your projector but i don't know what projector he has uh and behind your head yeah yep yep i like it uh, how big is Travis's Last thing? One? Yeah, it's all sound card stuff. It's not terribly complicated. I think we can oh, answer that. Sound card stuff, which means I'm not going to be saying anything. <laughs> Travis! Travis is a PC sound card in HT Omega Carlo Plus. I know nothing Sounds about that. Very impressive. Whoever Carlo is, he made it. It's not just Carlo, it's Plus. Yeah. That plus one. It supports 24-bit, 192 kilohertz via output uh via, i'm sorry output via this toss link optical audio connection his receiver is a pioneer elite vsx 45 tx it says it has 24 bit 192 kilohertz dax but if he sets his pc sound cards to output 24 at 192 he gets no sound everything works fine when he says it's 96 hertz what's the deal yeah. well if it doesn't work with the one and it does work with the other one i think the solution is <laughs> To just not use that. Other thing. I, mean, I think you already fight. This is an asked and answered question. Doc, it on, hurts Rob. when I go like this. Yeah. Um, Don't go like that. However, uh, so first of all, the only mention of this in the manual is a footnote. Of course. Yes. But there is a footnote in the Pioneer VSX 45TX manual, and it reads as follows I quote, This receiver can only play back Dolby Digital, PCM, in parentheses, 32 kilohertz, 44.1 kilohertz, 48 kilohertz, 88.2 kilohertz, and 96 kilohertz sampling frequencies, end parentheses, and DTS, digital signal formats. If your source is not one of these, select analog for playback. No mention of 192. <laughs> yeah. So, Just because they got the DAX doesn't mean they actually use them for anything. Right. So, yeah. so they explicitly say that the highest sampling frequency it'll support as a PCM audio signal is 96 kilohertz. Uh, you said that worked. You said 192 didn't. It tells you it doesn't mention 192, and if it says it's not one of the ones that it does mention, then it won't play it. So, uh, yeah, that all lines up. Why do all PC sound cards have Toslink audio outputs but not HDMI? Because Toslink is cheap as chips, and HDMI <laughs> costs a whole bunch of money. Wow. <laughs> They're trying to get you to buy that stuff. I don't know about that, but, uh, uh, well, the, the, yeah, the HDMI ports are usually found on your video card. Yeah. And uh, you can set that as your audio output device, and it will uh, either bit stream through, or if you set it to only output Dolby Digital, it'll send that. But, uh, yeah, the, the HDMI port is typically found on your video card. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess they could make an audio 
sound card with an HDMI output strictly for HDMI audio. But uh, but why? <laughs> why would they? They're why? assuming that either they're assuming that either your dedicated video card or the video that's just built into your motherboard has an HDMI output. So uh, I guess yeah. that's why. He asks. Lastly, are PC sound cards even relevant these days? They are if you want to be able to hear stuff on your computer. I think they're pretty relevant. <laughs> <laughs> they're relevant. For that. Well, I mean, it's just that. Try Everything to find a motherboard. Over HDMI. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a motherboard that doesn't have built-in audio, and then if you are connecting to an external thing, you can probably do it with HDMI, which means it's going out your video card instead of your sound card. So, do you need a dedicated sound card these days? Probably not. I mean, most of the time you don't, but maybe sometimes you do. You know, a lot of times people are connecting the HDMI to their monitor, which doesn't that's right doesn't have any sound capabilities. And if you're not in. using an actual AV receiver with an HDMI input, maybe you're using yeah. like PC speakers where it only works yeah. with the analog connections, and very often the analog outputs of the sound that's built into the motherboard is noisy as heck. Yeah. So at that point, a dedicated sound card makes sense. But for the optical output, if the only thing you're using is the optical output, you don't need a dedicated sound card for that. Right. That That's just, yeah, <laughs> that's unnecessary. All right, that's it for this week. With Who we got left? We got All one, right. righty. So we've got uh, Mark, Brian, and Jonathan. That's oh, that's three. it. Is it eight, 18 was total and we answered 15? Yeah, three more people. That's all that's left on our list. All right. Uh, so let's think. Do we think our listeners of the week first? Do we do that first? Or we, we usually do. Yeah. Well, Let's thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank all of our listeners from last week again. Plus, uh, we want to correct Grant and uh, not correct you, but correct ourselves yeah. in that we forgot to mention Grant and Amar. We got them kind of swooshed into one person. We did. And that was so my Grant fault. I apologize for that. So Grant A and Amar S, uh, th thank you very much. And uh, sorry, uh, apologies for mixing up the names last week there. And we want to thank Dale, who was our donor for this week. Yeah, Dale, thank you so much for the donation. They went to www.avrant.com and clicked on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and left us a PayPal donation. Thank you for that. We also want to thank our 61 patrons over at Patreon. Mm -hmm. Patreon.com slash Podcast. Thanks so much to our 61 patrons. And if you want your question answered on this podcast, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Antry. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.